When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello to all of you wonderful Unshaken Saints out there. I'm Jared Halverson, and I'm so glad you got back on the boat. I was worried that some of you would stay at the port in, in Thessalonica when it's time to move forward. Now, I'll admit, there's no more places for this cruise to go. Uh, as we have gone around the Mediterranean, we've stopped in Rome and Corinth and Galatia and Ephesus and Philippi and Colossae and Thessalonica. Did I cover them all? But now we're going from places to people. And this week we will study his letters to Timothy, there's two of those, and a letter to Titus and a final letter to Philemon. The next two weeks then we'll spend with his words to the Hebrews and then it's off to other apostles and we'll have to leave Paul behind, which is sad. I hope he's come to life for you and you've fallen in love with him. If that's the case, then you're in for a treat this week because these letters are a little different. Like I said, they're not meant, to, they're not meant for a place. They're not meant for a congregation of saints as much as they're meant for a specific individual that Paul has in mind. Now, to set this up, I want to dedicate this week's lesson to Bishop Ron Hershey and the former members of the BYU 174th Ward. Yeah, there's a lot of wards down there. Uh, that was the ward that my wife and I moved into when we were first married. It was a married student ward, and so we were all in the same stage of life. It was glorious. Uh, we're all newlyweds, and so we're figuring out how to be married. We're starting to have children, and so we're figuring out how to be parents. And we're, we're starting to serve in more significant callings and trying to figure out how to help build the kingdom. And Bishop and Sister Hershey were amazing mentors in all of that. It's funny because looking back, they weren't that much older than the rest of us, but they had so much wisdom and experience and such a deep desire to share it with the rest of us. It was amazing. Uh, so many of these friends I'm still friends with, still close to, because it was such a formative time in our lives. And so the Sedgwicks and the Wrights and the Confortos and the Kirklands and so many other couples too numerous to name, it was amazing. And I'm now teaching some of the children of those friends of mine, and it makes me feel really old. Thanks a lot. But we look back at those years with such fondness because the Hershey's, they really did mentor us. Uh, I'm thinking of bishopric meetings, for example, and ward council meetings. For most of the time we were there, I was in the bishopric and my wife was the Relief Society president. We got to hold hands during ward council. It was awesome. But Bishop was so intentional about training, not just running the ward, but showing us how to do it ourselves, because he really saw this as a, a laboratory in church leadership. And it really, really was. I mean, I swear that man had the Doctrine and Covenants memorized. And he would pull it out left and right to explain, so this is what I'm thinking when I do it interviews this way. Or the, these, this is how you extend callings in the Lord's way. And, and think about this and notice this. And so much of our meetings were spent, he was spent training us rather than just making decisions and extending callings and all those kinds of things. It was amazing. And the reason I bring that up, and the reason I dedicate this, this week's lesson to, to him and to all of us in that stage, is because that's what these letters are. Not Philemon. Philemon is kind of doing his own thing, and it's just one short letter, and we'll get to that at the end of this week's material. But the other three, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, they're called the pastoral letters. Because a pastor is a shepherd, that's what the word means, and in this case, it's a bishop. And Timothy was the first bishop of Ephesus, and Titus was the first bishop of Crete. And, and Paul is their mentor. He's their Bishop Hershey. And he is sending them letters to, to help them understand what it means to build the kingdom and to lead a congregation of saints. In some ways, you can refer to these three letters as the shepherd's handbook. And I love the thought of... Well, have you ever heard... I, I've heard of... of Apostles, for example, that as soon as they receive that calling, they reread the entire standard works just to try to make sense of what it means to be an apostle. Any of you who have been recently called as bishops, spend time in First and Second Timothy and Titus. The instructions to you are so personal and pointed. 
But it's not just for bishops. It's for any of us that are trying to serve in a calling. Any of us trying to be good shepherds. These shepherd handbooks will be helpful for us as well. Let me give you a little bit of background on Timothy and Titus, and then we'll dive right in. Okay? Now, Timothy we know a little bit of because he kept popping up in the book of Acts, as well in, in the epistles that we've studied so far. Think about how many of them were from Paul and from Timothy as a junior companion. And that's what he was for so many of these missions. He was incredible. Back in the book of Acts, when we first met him, we learned that he was the son of a Jewish convert to Christianity in his mother, and a Greek non-convert to Christianity, a, a Gentile, I should say, in his father. So Timothy becomes the patron saint of every part member family. And if you've been torn between family members and do I believe like my mom or not believe like my dad or vice versa, Timothy's your guy. And so talk about a, a tailor-made companion for Paul to be able to teach a Jewish and Gentile audience when Timothy is both of those melded into one. He's, he's amazing. No wonder Paul took him practically everywhere. Also, what's amazing to me about Timothy is he opted with mom and went with Christianity rather than, than uh, Greek or Gentile culture. And he chose as a grown man to be circumcised. Now, he didn't have to. This is post-Jerusalem conference, and so you don't have to pass through that part of Judaism on your way to Christianity. And yet Timothy decided, I'll do that lest I should offend my Jewish audience. I'll do that for their sake. I mean, talk about self-sacrifice, but I d don't want to stand in the way of their conversion in any way. And so if this helps me fit in with those people, I'll do that. Amazing. Now, compare that to Titus. And Titus, we don't know as much about. He doesn't uh, appear as frequently as Timothy does. His, his handwriting is not next to Paul's on, on many of the letters. But he was incredible, too. He served with Paul in Corinth, for example, and was actually really helpful in gathering the donations from the Corinthian saints to send this gift basket, so to speak, back to the people in Jerusalem that were suffering. Uh, if you remember in Corinth, there were all kinds of factions. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. And Titus was one who helped smooth the ruffled feathers and work on reconciling some of Paul's audience back to Paul. So his was a ministry of reconciliation, and he was very successful at it. No wonder Paul can trust him with a ministry in Crete. Crete is an island off the southern coast of Greece, and it was kind of known for its wickedness. And so, good luck down there, Titus. <laughs> I hope you do well. But one of the interesting things about Titus also, if Timothy is this example of, I don't have to be circumcised, but I will, to, to connect with, with, with Jewish converts, Titus in some ways was the opposite because he was a Gentile and never was circumcised, but fully embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while the Jerusalem conference was going on, remember this in Acts chapter 15, when Paul goes to, to weigh in on things, and Peter's had his vision, and they're trying to, to decide how much compromise do we need to make, Judaism and, and Jews and Gentiles and so on. Well, when they decided not to require circumcision, Titus, in some ways, was exhibit A, that it wasn't necessary. Remember Peter had said, hey, God's okay with Gentiles because he gives them the Holy Ghost just like he does to us. Well, in a similar vein, Paul brings Titus to that conference to say, do you want to see how incredibly strong and valiant and faithful an uncircumcised Gentile convert can be? Titus, take it away. And Titus became exhibit A for those who are no longer strangers or foreigners, but are true fellow citizens with the saints. It's beautiful. So pay close attention as we study these three letters Still pay attention when we get to Philemon, but <laughs> in a different vein. Pay attention to how church leaders are going to take the baton and run with it. In some ways, that is Paul's task. He's old enough to have been associated with, with Peter and James and John, though he wasn't around for Christ's mortal ministry. Okay? He hadn't been converted yet. But he's also young enough to go on these long missions and bring junior companions like Timothy and Titus along with him. So he's in some ways passing the baton from the first generation of apostles. He's now part of the next generation that's filling vacancies as apostles are, are, are being martyred. 
And he is passing that baton forward to bishops like Timothy and Titus. Like I said, Timothy is in Ephesus and Ephesus. Remember the letter that Paul wrote to them about being built on a foundation of prophets and apostles. Well, Timothy himself truly was learning from an apostle himself in Paul and now trying to lead the church there. Three things to be looking for as we dive into these letters. Remember, if they're church leaders and they're trying to, to shepherd their flocks uh, in their various communities, one thing to be aware of is the adversary because you're up against opposition. Okay? Paul's faced it everywhere he's gone and now it's gonna, the target is going to be on your chest. So prepare yourself. There is more talk of the adversary in these letters than most of the other letters Paul has written. Second thing is a focus on ethical living. Paul's the great theologian of the church, but the rubber has to hit the road at some point. And based on these incredible doctrines, how do I live? Now, Paul's going to teach Timothy and Titus to teach their members, this is what a godly life looks like. And that's what we're aiming for. The word godly or ungodly, for its opposite, or godliness is going to show up 17 times in these three letters. And they're not that long. So heavy emphasis on godliness. Keep an eye out for it every time it appears. And then the third thing is how do we overcome the adversary and live godly lives? Well, by holding on to true doctrine. Paul knows that doctrine. He's taught that doctrine. But he also knows the opposition that has pulled people away. Think about what he said uh, to the Ephesians, Timothy's own congregation, about being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You've got to guard against that. And so Paul will give a heavy emphasis on true doctrine and how to hold on to it. The word doctrine, coincidentally, will show up 17 times as well in these three letters. And so a very strong focal, focal point on making sure you know what, you're, what you know what to believe and you fully embrace it against the winds of false doctrine that are swirling all around you. Okay? So you with me? Uh, in some ways, I think Paul is telling these two bishops the same thing Joseph Smith said about how to lead a church. You teach correct principles and then let them govern themselves. Teach them principles about what true doctrine entails true principles that will help them live godly lives, true principles to overcome the adversary. And then you're off and running. And churches can begin to proliferate all over the Mediterranean world and, can keep, and keep spreading until they cover the earth. Okay? That's what we're trying to accomplish in our day. And so these three letters are still incredibly applicable to all of us. With that, chapter 1 of 1 Timothy here is Paul's salutation, very similar to what he normally says to whole congregations, but adds a, tiny, a few tiny details as he targets Timothy alone. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. I mean, I may be an apostle, but Jesus is our hope, and he's the only hope we have. I'm writing unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in practically every letter to a, to a place, Paul has blessed them with grace and peace. He's extended that to, him, to them in, in his salut, opening salutations. Here, yeah, Timothy, you're going to need grace too, enabling power to serve in your calling. And you're going to need peace to reassure you that you're doing well. But when you're not doing so well, since you are a mere mortal and a young one at that, trying to figure out how to lead a congregation, you'll need more than grace and peace. You'll need mercy as well. Because, yeah, you'll probably make mistakes. God gets it. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's part of the on-the-job training that God seems to prefer by sending 18 and 19-year-olds out, 18 and 19 year olds out as missionaries. <laughs> by, by extending callings to the uninitiated and, and building the kingdom on the back of a, of a lay ministry. It's amazing. And so, yes, mercy is extended. If you remember in the Ark of the Covenant, that box that held the treasures of ancient Israel, that box that was covered with what they called the mercy seat, the throne of grace, the atonement cover. Well, what does the atonement cover inside? Well, the tablets of stone 
There's broken law. I'm so grateful the atonement covers that. But the rod of Aaron was in there too. The rod that represented priesthood authority. What a blessing for anyone put in a position of leadership to know that the mistakes we make, despite our best efforts to avoid them, those mistakes are covered by the mercy seat, the atonement of Christ. Now, Paul wants Timothy to know that because he loves Timothy and knows that ah, he has big shoes to fill. He has a major responsibility. Actually, not even shoes. It's, he's the first bishop there. In some ways, it's, it's Paul's shoes that he's filling, but, but you're not an apostle. That's okay. You're a shepherd. You're a bishop. And God will give you all these blessings. I love you, Timothy, because you're my son. At least my son in the faith. That's what he calls him. My own son in the faith. In Puerto Rico, I loved meeting old timers that always had these cute like nicknames for, for you that they, when they loved you. They'd, I remember little old grandmas that would say, Oh, mi cielo, my, my heaven. Or mi vida, my life. It's like me in, in, in English when it's like, Oh, sweetheart. You know, they like, mi corazón, my heart. Best one I ever got was from this sweet little old man way out in the campo, out in the countryside. And after I taught him a first discussion, we were just wrapping up, and he's like, and he called me, Santo Hijo de mi alma, which means holy son of my soul. And I was like, what was the best compliment I ever got? I felt like I'd just been knighted by this sweet old Puerto Rican man. <laughs> the holy son of his soul? I just taught him a first discussion. Man. Well, that's how Paul feels about his junior companion. I mean, in the mission field, we do have nicknames like that for each other. When you train a missionary, you call him your son, or you call her your daughter. Uh, who's the trainer of your trainer? Well, if my trainer's my dad, then that's my grandpa. It's like, oh, you trained my trainer? Wow, grandpa, that, I'm your grandson. So good to meet you. The generations have come together at Zone Conference uh, to meet your grandma or your granddaughter. It's, it's amazing in the mission field. Well, evidently, Paul was the very first trainer who referred to his greenie as his son. So I, I, maybe we're on, on good ground to be able to do that, okay? My own trainer, by the way, he called me mi pequeño saltamonte, which means my little grasshopper. I asked him about that, and he said, oh, you've never seen those old kung fu TV shows? I'm like, huh? And evidently there was a kung fu TV show it dubbed over in Spanish. He was from Mexico. And, and, and the sensei would refer to his, uh, his apprentice, my little grasshopper. <laughs> my, mi pequeño saltamonte. And he, my trainer still calls me that to this day. Uh, well, I don't know if Timothy was a little, a little grasshopper, but as far as Paul was concerned, you are my son in the faith, and I love you. I'm trying to help you grow up in God so you can be a father of other people's faith as well. So he says to him in verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went to Macedonia, so there's been mission transfers. Paul had to go off to Macedonia, but he left Timothy behind to run the, run the church in Ephesus. And here's the instruction he left him. That thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. In those last two words, so do. That's your mission call. That's your setting apart blessing. That's your charge as a bishop to the church. And it's interesting that the very first thing that he gives them is keep the doctrine pure. This is the first of the 17 times we'll see that concept. And in fact, when he talks about godly edifying as the goal, that's the first of the 17 times he'll talk about being godly or seeking godliness. Okay? So right from the get-go, it seems to suggest there is going to be opposition. There is false doctrine blowing people about to and fro. Remember, it was to the Ephesian saints Paul warned them that there will be cunning craftiness and slight of men and lying in wait to deceive. No wonder you have to build yourself on a foundation of prophets and apostles. Well, through Timothy, that's what has to happen. Timothy, you know my do the doctrine of Christ that I've been teaching. You've been following me around my missions. You know your stuff. So when you hear people teaching other doctrines, charge them to stop. When you hear people, oh, spinning fables instead of teaching truth, then reel them back in. When you see people going off in endless genealogies, now for any of you who are working on family history, that does not apply to you, okay? Uh, that, though that's important family history work. So follow those genealogies all, all the way back. But here when he talks about fables and endless genealogies, 
there's a certain sense in rabbinic Judaism, for example, that there's these traditions of the fathers, but are they fable or fact? Hard to tell. And some of these endless genealogies, there were those Gnostics, for example. And the Gnostics, it comes from a Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. But this is knowledge so far beyond, like outside the norm, that people are like, oh, forget the milk and forget even the meat. We got the real stuff. We're in the know. And so come our way and forget that simple doctrine that prophets and apostles are teaching. No, we got, we got the good stuff over here. And sometimes they would even read into Old Testament genealogies some kind of mystical, symbolic understanding. It's these secret messages that when you see the dates and the genealogies and it's like, well, wow, really? That's amazing. Like, no, the genealogies are simply there to help us see we're, what tribe we're from, and that we're Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and trace things back to Adam and Eve, and so on. It's, Paul is, war, is, wa, is warning Timothy, look out for those that are trying to, I don't know, create a following because they seem to be possessors of knowledge that other people just don't have access to. The problem, as he puts it there, is those kinds of things just minister questions. Or we would say, multiply questions. It's just speculation. And pretty soon we're back on Mars Hill with the Epicureans and Stoics just wanting to talk about some new thing, but never getting to a real understanding of truth. No, we don't want to multiply questions. We want to edify people in godly ways. So stick to pure, simple, true doctrine. Okay? In our days, they call it the correlation department or when things go through correlation. Ultimately, it's the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve that are responsible for the purity of our revealed doctrine. But what they have done is created a committee of people who have spent a lifetime studying and teaching doctrine. They know it as well as anyone can. And they have the ear of, or excuse me, the apostles and prophets have their ear. They, they will make sure that the correlation committee understands true doctrine. And then the correlation committee reads everything. Every article that ever comes out in a, a church-produced venue so that you can trust what you're reading. In some ways here, Paul is telling Timothy, you need to make sure everything passes correlation. Okay? Keep the doctrine pure. Otherwise, people will be, instead of digging down deep into the taproot, they will be walking out on the branches until pretty soon they're walking out on thin air. They will fall, and so will those who follow them. So keep them close to the trunk. He says similar things in verse 5 through 7. Now the end of the commandment, and by end here, he, he doesn't mean like termination point. There's no expiration date on God's commandments. He means the end as in the goal, the aim, the purpose. The aim of it all, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. That's what we've always been aiming for. Think about the discussion of gifts of the Spirit back in 1 Corinthians. They're all amazing, but yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And the most excellent gift of them all is charity. It's the one that never faileth. So what was the purpose or end of every commandment God ever gave, including the law of Moses? The law of Moses was meant to be our schoolmaster, right Galatians? It was meant to point our souls to something greater. And that was the kind of charity that a Christ-like life instills in you. The kind of good conscience that comes through remission of sins through Jesus Christ. Faith unfeigned, as in unfaked. It's the real thing because you believe in the real one, namely Jesus. So we're trying to focus everything. The end of it all was to prepare us to receive and accept Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, not everybody took it that way. So, and we've seen this repeatedly in Paul's letters, where the, the law became an end in and of itself, instead of the end of the law being the development of these Christ-like attributes. And so for those for whom oh, the law became the final destination, when it was intended just to be a signpost saying, <laughs> keep, keep going forward, for those for whom commandments became the graduation ceremony, instead of your mere schoolmaster to help you come unto Christ, you've missed the point. That's not the end of it all. And the way he says it next is fascinating. From which, so from that end of the commandment, 
Some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. And so it's like the law is preparing you. It's getting you to this place where you can become truly Christ-like. And some people are like, whoa, can't have that happen. And they swerve. I love that word. I mean, the Greek could mean simply to miss the mark. I was a little bit off. It's like what Jacob said about those who look beyond the mark. And that's what he was describing in the previous passage. Looking beyond the mark so we can multiply questions and, and be the type of people who know all this stuff. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what it's about. Okay? The plain, simple commandments of God were meant to create better people out of us. All those to-dos had a to-be in mind. But some people, either not wanting to become that, or thinking the law really was its own thing, and that's the focal point, they swerved. And what a beautiful choice of words from the King James translators. Because when I think swerve, I do picture someone on the freeway and a, and a deer jumps out and, and you swerve to miss it. Actually, you probably shouldn't because you might end up creating greater damage and hitting something worse than, than the deer. I've hit a few deer in my day. Uh, if there's something in the road though that you're almost hit and you swerve away from it and you're like, that was so close. I, was, I, I almost hit that thing. But what's that thing here? <laughs> they swerved from what? They swerved away from the law? Or they swerved away from the commandments? Or they swerved away from the attributes of Christ? Why would you swerve from that? Well, think about it. It's like, I don't want to... I mean, an unfeigned faith? If I know the truth, then I'm, I'm accountable to, to live it. <clears throat> Whew, glad I missed that. If I have a clear conscience, then I can no longer be past feeling, and I can no longer eat, drink, and be merry, because I know better. I mean, you understand what's happening? Again, the language really paints an, a powerful picture of, who that was close. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, but oh, good thing I swerved just in the nick of time and missed it. Well, what did you hit instead? What did he say? You've swerved away from that and turned aside unto vain jangling? What's that? Well, that could also be translated idle gossip, or meaningless chatter. But I like the word jangling. I can kind of picture somebody just shaking their keys, and that there's no message there. It's just noise. But that's what some people are, are offering. Forget the law. We don't have to keep any of those commandments. We can do our own thing. It just veer away, swerve, and let's turn instead to vain jangling with multiplied questions and forget godly edifying and fables and endless genealogies and, and things that we know and let's talk about. Now, that's, that's not what true doctrine does. So forget the vain jangling. Let's, let's learn some real truth, shall we? I mean, the, what he says in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. That's the same kind of problem we've been dealing with for the last few verses. Everybody wants to be a teacher. They want to be a Gnostic. They want to know this stuff. And, well, is it bad to be a teacher? I hope not. That's what I am. And I wanted to be a teacher with all my heart. But why? Is it to be seen of man? That's just priestcraft. Is it so that all eyes are on me and look how much I know? And Oh, careful, because those kinds of teachers actually don't know what they're talking about. They, they understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. There's something here about the purity of our motives. I worry sometimes when I hear people like, oh, I want to go to graduate school. Really? What do you want to study? Well, I, don't, I don't care. I just want to have a PhD. Okay, why? Well, just like Dr. So-and-so, or I get those letters after my last name. It's like, really? That's why you're going to do it? Don't, don't put yourself or your family through it. Make sure your, no, your, your motives are more noble than that. It's not a more seen would I be. It's a more used would I be. And perhaps the more I learn, the better I will teach. That needs to be our purpose. And that's the focal point here for Timothy. Timothy's doing fine. It's these other people he might have to charge. Please keep doctrine pure. Teach the simple truths of the gospel. He says in verse 8, But we know that the law is good. And then he qualifies it. If a man use it lawfully. Which is an interesting condition there. 
in some ways, this is another equivalent of what Paul kept saying to the, to the Romans about God forbid. Remember, God forbid is his bumper bowling. It's like I'm trying to correct, but oh, don't overcorrect. And so to those legalists in Rome, and he's telling them, you're not going to be saved by the law. You can only be saved by grace. And then you picture people going, oh, so the law doesn't even matter. I didn't have to keep it. I could have swerved away from it a long time ago. And he's like, no, 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 quit overcorrecting. Don't overswing the pendulum. That's not what I'm saying. God forbid. As he puts it here, the law is good. And in fact, its goals were incredible. The end of the law was charity out of a pure heart and real faith. It was supposed to change you. Here, though, if people are swerving away from that and thinking it's an end in and of itself, then no, you missed the point. So let me reaffirm the goodness of the law, but also let me remind you, you have to, you have to approach the law lawfully. You have to use it in the way the Lord intended. What he says next helps clarify that. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. And then Paul launches forth in one of his great lists of sins that he's so well known for. Who else is the law for? Well, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And just in case I missed anything, <laughs> if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That's Paul's equivalent of etc., etc. <laughs> that, that covers all the other sins that Paul wasn't able to squeeze in into that passage. If you remember King Benjamin and saying, I can't list every sin because you guys are creative. You think of all kinds of ways to do things that are wrong. Paul <laughs> actually tried harder than King Benjamin to list them all. And in this instance, I think he has a real purpose in mind. Because if the law was not intended for righteous people, but for wicked people, well, let me describe the people that needed specific laws because we've got a lot of specific laws out there. Think about the Ten Commandments, for example. And... Did we really have to have those laid out in front of us? Did God really have to spell it out? Because literally, that's what he did. He spelled out these commandments as he wrote on the tablets with his own finger. Thou shalt not kill. Nobody had to tell me that. Well, then again, if there are murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, I guess they had to be told. Thou shalt not commit adultery? Why would I do that? Well, the whoremongers probably need that reminder. I'm not going to steal from somebody. I, 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 wouldn't do, I wouldn't want them to do that to me. Why would I do it to them? Well, yeah, you don't need to be told that. But the thieves do. So sorry for make, making me be so clear and specifying everything you shouldn't do. Some people have to have it all spelled out. Think about what Abinadi said to King Noah and the wicked priests, that the law of Moses had to be super strict. It had to be a law of performances and ordinances to keep them in constant remembrance of the Lord their God because they were forgetful. They were the type that did have to be commanded in all things. Remember the Doctrine and Covenants language? That's a, a slothful and not a wise servant. Well, for slothful servants, they have to be told what to do. For unwise people, they have to be commanded in all things. They haven't yet internalized the correct principles to be able to govern themselves. Again, I love that Paul is trying to teach a church leader these ideas. Remember that the law is good. It has a higher purpose. It's there for people who need it. And so don't just take it away assuming people got it. Don't let them govern themselves until they've truly learned the correct principles. You with me? But I do love the way he put it. The law wasn't, was never intended for righteous people. It's a bar they've already cleared. So you don't have to establish that line. The line exists for those that are looking for ways to go underneath it. I remember one day at the end of a long day at the Institute, I was the last teacher in the building. I taught a night class and then I met with some students and it was a late night. And I'm finally heading home. And as I'm leaving, there's one other person in the building and it's the night custodian. A wonderful Latino brother. I went to go talk to him because lo we loved practicing our Espanol together. And I was asking him about his, his I'm like, man, late night for you. He's like, oh, actually, early morning for me. Uh, I, do that, I do this at night, and 
I'm just starting out. I'm like, wow. And we somehow got into this conversation of here I am, the teacher, when the director isn't there making sure I was in class. And there he is cleaning the building where there's no supervisor cracking the whip and telling him he missed a spot. There we were, unsupervised, but doing what we were supposed to do. And I turned to this friend and I said to him, I think my Spanish was correct. I said, los jefes existen para los que necesitan los jefes. In other words, bosses exist for people who need bosses which is exactly what Paul is saying here. The law exists for people who need the law. But if you don't need it, it's because you're already living it without having to be told. You understand? There's something powerful about not needing that kind of micromanaged supervision. It's what Elder Packer taught about the leash on the dog that sags because the dog is willing to be closer to the master than required. Oh, you don't need the leash anymore as opposed to the leash that's tight and taut and, yo, you still need it because the dog wants to be further away than you want it to be, okay? Keep that in mind. When you're teaching children and they're chafing against the law, as long as you can do it gently and non-confrontationally, you might want to teach the principle in this passage that I wish you didn't need the law either. And the day will come where you don't need it at all. But you have to internalize these correct principles you'll see the value in what the law is trying to accomplish. Okay. Now with that, Paul says something fascinating next. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, that's grace, that's the enabling power, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now you remember back in Thessalonians, he said something similar? that I was allowed of God to be entrusted with the gospel. There's the same sense, like, pinch me, I'm a missionary. I can't believe it. I can't believe he let me do this. He counted me faithful, and he put me in the ministry. Can you believe that? Well, we look at Paul, and we're like, well, yeah, you're amazing. Of course he's going to pick someone like you. But Paul's like, no, not at all. Keep reading. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. That's who I was. Don't think Paul the Apostle. Think Paul the Persecutor. Don't think the one who is oh, facing martyrdom, but rather the one that, that's assisting in the martyrdom of Stephen. I had all the momentum in the world, but the worst direction imaginable. And yet God saw my potential. And he saw through my problems and he reached down and picked me up and turned me around and gave me the right direction. And then my momentum became a gift. I love Paul's self-perception. I can't believe that God would gamble on me and give me the chance to preach the gospel when I didn't deserve it. He goes on and explains a little bit more of his background. He says, but I obtained mercy. And again, that's the miracle he's referring to. Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was doing God favors by persecuting Christians. I'd had no idea I was kicking against the pricks. But he, this good, gentle shepherd, helped me move in the right direction. He said, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It's such a beautiful autobiographical glimpse of Paul's sense of absolute humility and gratitude. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. How could he do that? He says in verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I was the worst of the bunch. This is like Alma. I can't believe that God rescued me and gave me a second chance. Sons of Mosiah, same thing. All of us, we're all sinners, but that's why Jesus came. No wonder it's a faithful saying. No wonder it's something Paul faithfully says everywhere he can. Now he goes on in this verse. It's amazing. He says, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy. So let me explain to you why God gave me that mercy. Because it should be shocking to everybody. It's a miracle to me. But why would I obtain mercy? That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. 
Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. At the end there, it's almost like Paul bursts out into song, this hymn of praise. Oh, what a blessing that the Lord took pity, mercy on me. And why? Did you catch what he said? It's so God could prove his long suffering. What do you mean? Think about it. If he could put up with me, <laughs> he could put up with anybody. If he can take the chief sinner and save him, then no one is beyond his redeeming reach. In fact, he was establishing a pattern. That's the word he uses for a pattern to those that would come later. Is there any hope for me? Well, he changed Paul, didn't he? Are we still saying that 2,000 years later? Well, if there could be a Paul, if there could be an, uh, an Alma the Younger, if there could be a Sons of Mosiah, maybe there's hope. That, that is so beautiful. And I love the way Paul sees himself. I'm exhibit A of God's long suffering because I was a piece of work, but he worked on me. I wonder if he's dropping hints at Timothy to say, you know those people I just warned you about? You have to charge to stop t speculating and teaching false doctrine. But don't give up on them. Yes, call them to repentance, but trust they can repent. I did. I was just like the punks that I was describing. But God in his long suffering and his mercy set an example, a pattern he's been following ever since. So follow that pattern yourself too, Timothy and hold out hope. If our hope is in that King, eternal, immortal, all wise, the Lord is able to make them holy. So he says in verse 18 through 20, like the end of this charge, this is like the setting apart blessing in some ways. And this is the last thing he says as part of it. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. Santo hijo de mi alma according to the prophecies which went before on thee. And I wonder about that. Is that some kind of patriarchal blessing, perhaps? Some kinds of prophecies that were on him? This is what you'll do. This is what you'll accomplish. This is your God-given potential, your spiritual gifts that you'll live into. And so I charge you that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Whew. Like, whew, wow, okay, strong language there at the end. Can we back up a little bit before you got angry, Paul? Oh, yeah, first half. Paul, Paul is telling Timothy, oh, son, you were made for this. I know this calling might feel overwhelming, but think back to every blessing you've ever received. Think back to the childhood that was that seemed so difficult being raised in a part member family and being pulled in both directions well now you know how the members of the church in Ephesus feel and being pulled in both directions and helping them stay faithful just like you did you were made for this so live into that go fight a good warfare it was to the Ephesians Paul taught the armor of God well their commander-in-chief their local general is going to need to be wearing it too. And Paul will draw upon these military metaphors several times in these letters. But hold to the faith. Hold to good conscience. And then he warns them. There have been some that have swerved, right? That have turned aside, away from those things. And what happened to them? They made shipwreck. Shipwreck. Again, if we were headed toward the millennial port on that good ship Zion, and people were like, whoa, I don't want to, I don't want to crash into conscience. It'll make me feel bad. I don't want to give, uh, put into port in a place that is going to make me more Christ-like. No, I want to do my own thing. So, er, swerve. But what did they hit instead? <laughs> it wasn't just vain janglings. It was, it was a reef and rocks of consequence. And so here they made shipwreck of their faith. And he singles out, Hymenaeus and Alexander. And we don't know anything about them, except the fact that they've done something bad enough that Paul has some strong feelings. To the point that he said, I've delivered them unto Satan? Whoa, what is that supposed to mean? Now, be careful here. 
This, it, it's, it sounds like harsh treatment. Really, it's just harsh language. Okay? And Paul sometimes used that. Okay? Strongly worded rhetoric. What he's describing there is simply disfellowshipment or excommunication. Which sounds like hard things too, but to disfellowship, you're not willing to participate in the fellowship of his sufferings. So it's not, you're not part of the fellowship of the saints. You've been disfellowshipped. Or excommunication, you're outside the communion of the saints. And that was your choice. You remember last week in, uh, to the Thessalonians when he was describing people that just would not contribute? They wouldn't lift where they stand. And so they had to be withdrawn from the community. But do that lovingly instead of contentiously. Do it like a brother instead of an enemy is what he said. Remember that? Because brothers, teammates, hold each other accountable. We're in this. you got to pull your weight. And so this is like Doctrine and Covenants 121. Show a greater outpouring of love so that they know you're not their enemy. The same thing would be had here. But the idea is to excommunicate, to disfellowship. Is that delivering them unto Satan? Well, think about it. If there's only two masters and you're going to end up serving one of them, part of the problem without any kind of discipline, without any kind of accountability, is somebody can think they're holding on to Jesus with one hand and holding on to the world with the other. This is my dad. This is my mom. Remember we talked about that? Who's your daddy? And Christ refuses to marry the world. He's already married to the church. Well, who's the world married to then? Satan. There it is. Have you ever been in a store and you have a little child that is like holding on to a pants leg and they thought it was dad's leg that they were holding on to. And then they, they like look up and it's a stranger. They got kind of separated from dad at some point and then they just saw a pants, you know, leg and they grabbed the hold. It's like the, the father comes around to, to look at them and all of a sudden the child realizes, who have I been holding on to this whole time? Ah, you're not my daddy, <laughs> right? Well, in a way, people like Hymenaeus and Alexander are holding on to the world with one hand thinking they're holding on to Jesus with the other. And Paul is telling Timothy, you, you can't let that happen because they're going to make shipwreck of their faith because Christ will have nothing to do with the world. So if you withdraw Jesus, have him come around to the other side to make eye contact and like, look, you're not holding on to me. Look at who you're holding on to. Because if you're holding on to the world with one, by default, look up, Yikes. I'm not going to say, I'm so glad when daddy comes home, because it's Satan. That's that dad. You with me? So withdraw. Let, him rec let these two recognize who they've delivered themselves over to. And if we can treat them like brothers through the whole process, then hopefully they will come to their senses and return to the faith. Even crashing up against the rocks is not the end of the voyage if we can send out lifeboats and help them return. That's going to be your job, Timothy. Do it well. In fact, follow the example of him who did it best of all, which is Jesus. You remember, he's the one that came to save sinners, including sinner in chief, namely me. That's what chapter 2 is all about, or at least the beginning. He says this in verse 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, now, so far, so good, until he gets more specific. For kings and for all that are in authority. And to that, we'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to pray for Caesar. He's making our life miserable, not good. And you could picture Paul saying, exactly. That's why you need to pray for him. Give thanks for any good thing. Make a supplication to, that they'll avoid the bad things. We're under the Roman thumb, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So we somehow have to learn to be good citizens as well as good saints and hope that our political leaders will honor some semblance of religious freedom. The way he says it in the next phrase, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's why we're trying to get along with everybody. It's not just a live and let live kind of no, laissez-faire approach. No, we're trying to be positive influences. We're trying to be good citizens so we can end up being godly and honest. So let's live quiet and peaceable in the meantime. After all, he says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. 
Now, we got to pause there because if we take that verse at face value, it sounds like, hey, everybody's in. After all, God will have all men to be saved. Hmm, nobody's condemned? No wonder we can put it on Jesus' tab. He wants us all in. Sweet. Now, that's presuming upon his grace. God forbid. That is cheap grace and sloppy agape. And Paul has warned against that repeatedly. So what does he mean by this? Does he will everyone's salvation? Well, he wants it. But is the will the equivalent of the deed? That's the question. There's actually a Joseph Smith translation that clarifies all of this by inspiration in really helpful ways. Not only does it clarify, it adds to in really powerful ways. So listen to this. When it talks about Jesus, he's, it says, who is willing to have all men to be saved? So it's not that he wills it, it's that he's willing that it happen. It's what he, it's what he wants. It's what he wants more than anything. Yes, it's his will to save all men, but he won't do it against their will. There's that thing called agency after all, right? So he's willing. He also wants them to come into the knowledge of the truth. And then this beautiful addition, which is in Christ Jesus, who is the only begotten son of God and ordained to be a mediator between God and man, who is one God and hath power over all men. Now that's Jesus for you. He is the only begotten. He's the mediator. He's the one that makes it possible, on the one hand, to honor our agency, even when we misuse it, so that we can learn from that misuse and start using it better, so that our will can be reconciled to the will of the Father, so that the Father's will in saving us can coincide with our will to be saved. Hmm. Jesus did all that? Oh, yeah. He came to save sinners, after all. Look at me. I, it wasn't my will to follow him, but he gave me the chance to reconcile my will. He helped me change my mind and my heart and my direction and everything else. Amazing what he did. Remember that hymn? It's one of my favorites, although we hardly ever sing it. It was in the very first hymn book that Emma Smith compiled. And it pushes back against the false reading of this that would lead to a false doctrine of everybody's in. It's called know, know this that every soul is free. And that's beautiful doctrine. Even if it allows us to go against God's best wishes for us. Know this that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. For this eternal truth is given that God will force no man to heaven. He's not going to drag anyone in and kicking and screaming. No, he's going to work in us and on us. That's what the end of the commandments was for, right? To change our hearts. And if they're changed, then we will be willing to accept what God was willing to do all along, which was to change us. Okay? Changed hearts, changed minds. That's what we're after. It's what Timothy, as a church leader, needs to be after for his, his flock. Now, verse 5, he continues to speak of Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And by man, he's not emphasizing gender. He's emphasizing humanity, the human Christ Jesus. This is Christ's condescension. Can you believe he came down to our level, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle? I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. What Paul just said was, Jesus came down without his regal robes. He condescended to be the man Jesus. It's almost like he put on oh, commoner's clothes so he could mingle among the masses and then free us from our self-imposed imprisonment. He had to be like us. He had to get us. He had to understand us. But do we understand him? At the time, people didn't. That's the tragedy. That's what he says about this. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The idea there is people didn't get it. They didn't bear testimony of him when they saw him right in front of their, their faces. 
I mean, some did. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, thank you, John. But the vast majority, no man is prophet in his own country. But someday, he would be testified of in due time. And it's Paul's time. It's, it's Jesus' time to be testified of. And so when Paul says, that's what I was ordained to do, Timothy, that's what you're ordained to do. I mean, have you ever realized that often a, a great scientist or a great thinker or a great uh, musician or composer or, or poet, sometimes they go unnoticed during their lifetimes. And looking back in retrospect, it's like, how's that possible? It's like, I don't know. People, no, again, no man's con- a prop in his country. But posthumously, after death, people looked back and saw, wow, that creator, that thinker, that writer was ahead of their time. And it's time to give them the honor they deserve. That's how Paul feels about Jesus. It's time to testify. Timothy, do it. So do. Okay, bear witness of the Jesus you've come to know. And then the rest of this chapter gets difficult. Look at verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now keep the beginning of this chapter in mind as we now try, with fear and trepidation, to navigate the end of this chapter. Because it gets really hard. Okay, Brace yourself. How did it start? Well, we need to be praying for everybody everywhere. Especially our local leaders or kings and Caesars and emperors themselves because we are stuck living in this time period. We're living at a time where people didn't see Jesus for who he was. So they won't see apostles for who we are or church members for who you are. We need to learn to get along with the powers that be. And that's hard. There's there's a Goldilocks zone here, and it's really narrow at times because we're trying to make compromises with culture, but yet we can't go the worldly way or, well, we'll be delivered to Satan like Hymenaeus and Alexander. But we kind of have to be good citizens and good neighbors so that we can even live the gospel at all. Well, live it all, let alone live the gospel. You understand what Paul is aiming for? Somehow we're going to have to navigate some narrow middle ground to be able to survive as a community of saints. We're up, up against the odds here in Ephesus. Okay, so Timothy, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We're going to have to figure out how to do it. Now, the first piece of advice he gives is for the people that are out praying. Okay, so yes, pray for your leaders. That will go a long way where they're like, well, I mean, we're not worshiping them. Don't get me wrong. We're definitely not doing that. Okay, no pagan party, no, no uh, Babylonian barbecue like we've talked about before. But pray for them and let people know, let your leaders know that we, we have your best interest at heart and we hope that you have our best interest at heart as well. We're trying to be good citizens as well as good saints. And so we are lifting up holy hands without wrath. We're not praying that God will destroy Caesar. Without doubting, we're not, we're not doubting that God will work things out somehow in his way and in his, and in his time. We're praying with Holy hands uplifted. This is an important detail too. Because remember what Jesus warned about in the Sermon on the Mount? That if you're praying on the street corner to be seen of men and hear your many words, how oh, good luck with your reward. I hope they'll give it to you because I'm not. That's not. You're praying to the people, not to me. You're praying to be seen of men, not to be heard of God. So you've got to be careful. Here, it's holy hands you're lifting up. And why lift them? What, to draw attention? Well, in a way, but not attention to you. Lift your hands and people are like, what's he pointing to? Ah, God, can I raise your sights and lift your eyes to heaven so you see who's really worth praying to and praising? Far beyond Caesar. Though don't tell Caesar I said that. Okay? You with me so far? With that, then take one. I'm trying to go baby steps in the next few verses because they're really hard. So the next one, verse 9, we've shifted from the men that are out praying, but doing it in a way that glorifies God instead of self. Now let's shift to the women in verse 9. But it's the same principle I'm trying to teach. Notice the first phrase. In like manner also. So in the same way I'm telling the men to pray humbly, women, I have some similar advice for you. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety 
or as some might say, with decency and propriety, or with modesty and self-control. Not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness. And remember, that's the word we keep looking for. That's what we're after. What would women professing godliness wear? Well, with good works. That's what they would array themselves in. Which is actually a really beautiful passage. I think we've had kind of a fraught history with our emphasis on modesty. And having heard from a lot of young women and from older women, that that can, be, that, can, that can come across in the wrong way because it seems to sexualize everything. And what I love about Paul's discussion of modesty in these last two verses is it's not in the context of immorality. That's not an issue he's raising here. It's more in a matter of are you trying to draw attention to yourself or to God? That's how he couches the concept of modesty. And I think if we were to teach it in those terms, then not only would it be more palatable to people, it, in some ways it would be more far-reaching. It would apply to the, the guys as well as the girls. It would apply be far beyond just the kinds of clothing we're wearing. It's in so many ways, are you trying to be the center of attention? Are you trying to gather, get the, stand in the center of the spotlight? Or are you trying to glorify God? And that can be modesty in, not just in clothing, but and not just dress and appearance, but in so many things we do. Are we glorifying God? In, again, if we want to go back to the Sermon on the Mount, think about what Jesus said about letting your light so shine. Wait, isn't that about get, calling attention? Yeah, but not to you. Keep reading. Let your light so shine before men. Why? So they can see your good works. Remember, what are the women wearing? Good works. That they may see your good works and glorify whom? your Father which art in heaven. You see, if you are a woman living in the Greco-Roman world, you've been a good, a wealthy Gentile in Ephesus, for example, and as you're walking around the marketplace, the, the Agora, you want the world to see you. Sadly, in those days, women had such a minimal place in society. We're going to talk more about that in just a second. It was a hard time to be a woman. And that's described in most of human history, sadly. But in this time when women were so often invisible in places of power or prominence, they wanted to get... It's human nature. We want attention, right? It's the natural man and the natural woman in all of us. And so how can I be seen when I'm out in the marketplace? Well, let's... How about broided hair? How about some gold and some pearls and some costly apparel? All eyes on me. They may be looking at the men for their power and their wisdom, but they'll look at the women for their beauty and their wealth. And Paul is worried about all of those. That's immodesty in all kinds of ways. There's so many different examples of that. And we're trying to lift people's eyes to heaven, not to ourselves. Okay? Now, if we have that clear, then are you ready to tiptoe across the, the most dangerous terrain in 1 Timothy? The next few verses are extremely hard. In verse 11, he says, he's still speaking about women now, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, ouch, that's a hard saying. Who can hear it? There are some that even say, oh, Paul couldn't have said that. Expunge it from the record. Get that out of here. That must have been some later extrapolation. Or some have said, oh, Paul said it. Well, Paul, then you're dead wrong. Ooh, what do we do with this verse? This is one of those that I... I mentioned this in a previous, le uh, pre previous lesson about the snicker scriptures. Snickers not as in candy bar, but as in kind of chuckling under your breath. Uh, it was to refer to certain immature boys that I taught in seminary, that when it was their turn to teach the spiritual thought as the devotional, they gave something that was neither spiritual nor a sign of any good thought on their part. Because they'd come up and read some verse from Paul that was mis misogynistic and male chauvinistic, and, and they'd read it, and then they'd snicker on their way back to the seat and kind of laugh at the girls all around them. It was frustrating. It was immature, like I said. But... 
it was in the Bible. And so it's like, what do we do with that? Now this, like I said, is really hard. I want, to me, the great gift of, of studying history and the discipline of history is it forces you to contend with context. That everything has to be kept in its historical context. The great sin uh, that must be avoided in history is the sin of presentism, which is judging the past by the standards of the present. That's not fair. I hope our descendants aren't presentists or they'll condemn us by their future standards. It's not fair, okay? So what are the standards in that day? Well, like I was just describing, women have hardly any place at all in ancient Greco-Roman society. We've actually seen Jesus really push back against that with Mary Magdalene, for example, or with Mary and Martha. And speaking to the Samaritan woman and the Syrophoenician woman, when it comes to gender issues and ethnic or racial issues, Jesus was light years ahead of his day, okay? He even broke his own so-called rules. Uh, I was like, I know it's not time for the Gentiles yet, but we're gonna get there, and these people are amazing. We might as well call them Jews and treat them that way, okay? Your faith hath made thee whole, yeah, amazing. Paul, in his own way, was ahead of his time as well. Think about his associations with Lydia, for example, that amazing seller of purple, or the obvious connection he had with Aquila, the tent maker, and his wife, Priscilla, a fellow tent maker. We're gonna actually see him refer to her again by the end of these letters today. Uh, in the book of Acts, Paul does not appear to be a male chauvinist. It's only in some of his letters that it comes across that he is. And how does that work? Well, that's part of the challenge of history is, spiritually speaking, yes, Paul was ahead of his time. But in other ways, Paul was a product of his time. And that's true of all of us. There were things that Brigham Young said that we look back at and think, oh, how could you say that? Well, the same way everybody was saying that with very rare exceptions. And times where Brigham was ahead of his time and times where he was a product of his time. And you can say that about just about all of us, okay? So please keep that in mind. I also wonder if what he was saying earlier about the law, this is when you're proving contraries and you're trying to correct from one extreme, remember the hardest part is to correct without overcorrecting. And often you know about the correction, but people you're trying to help swing the pendulum way too far. So when he's saying, oh, forget Jewish legalism, then they're like, sweet, moral anarchy. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa God forbid, right? And when it comes to a greater equality of the genders, because it is Paul who also says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. He's putting wives on that level, the church itself. He's used, he uses maternal metaphors. It's amazing how he views sister saints and we've seen it repeatedly. To wives, look to your husbands the way the church looks to Christ. And, and best case scenario, there's neither man without the woman nor woman without the man in the Lord, right? Paul is preaching equality to push back or to correct from the massive inequality that took place in his time period. But here's the challenge. There's a couple of possibilities. One possibility is, did the women take it too far? And was it, instead of correction, it was overcorrection, just like, a, hey, we don't need the law, then we can do whatever we want, or we shouldn't be under the male thumb, they should be under ours. And are we replacing a patriarchy with a matriarchy that's just gonna have the same problems in reverse? That actually seems to be what happens in a lot of today's contexts. And it's just another overcorrection. That's one possibility, and especially among these specific because Paul doesn't mention this in all of his letters. There were some things in, Corinth, in the Corinthian letters that seemed chauvinistic. And then there's this in his letter to, to Timothy and the church in Ephesus that seemed to be chauvinistic as well. Was this a specific situation with women over swinging the pendulum? Perhaps, I don't know. Was it a possibility though also of Paul just, I can't, it's not even I'm overcorrecting. I can't fully correct yet because society won't allow it. Remember how this letter or how this chapter began. There are the powers that be. There are kings and rulers and we have to pray for them and live 
quiet and peaceable lives or they'll destroy the church. This is that hard Goldilocks zone of how much am I willing to compromise with culture. This is being in the world but not of the world. And how much can I be in it and get along with those around me in hopes of changing things from inside? Because if I refuse to come in and try to change it all from outside, they'll probably kick me all the way out until I no longer exist. The early church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints faced the same problems racially when they tried to establish Zion in the middle of a slave state. That was incredibly hard. And they weren't... I mean, they were mostly from New England and, and from the North, and so not slaveholder so Southerners like, like their neighbors were. And it's like, how on earth are we going to establish the church here when our neighbors want to drive us out? This is tough. So is there a sense of, sisters, I am so sorry you're going to have to wait a while. Within the church, I hope you feel a level of equality far beyond anything you felt in the outside world. But in terms of... Well, let me back up. We saw this, I believe, in the letters to the Corinthians. First of all, the gifts of the Spirit are non-gender specific. The gifts of God are given to His daughters as much as to His sons. There's no difference there. Everyone has gifts of God. And in a previous letter, Paul even talked about regulating, oh, taking turns in preaching and prophesying. And he talks about men and women doing that. So he has no problem with women speaking in church and prophesying in church, exercising their spiritual gifts. Then why on earth would he say this here? And again, is it situation specific? Is it a particular location? Is it, and we've mentioned this before too, is it a matter of taking a telestial level and trying to raise it to a terrestrial because there's no way to get them to a celestial level quite yet? I mean, that's what the Law of Moses was for, right? A stepping stool, a schoolmaster. Are we doing something similar? It's like right now, Greco-Roman society is misogynistic and patriarchal. Which of those two can we change? Can we change the patriarchal nature of society at large as a tiny, beleaguered religious minority? Hmm, probably not. But can we work on the misogyny within that patriarchal society and show people a better way? As President Benson used to say, can we work from the inside out instead of from the outside in so that we change Changed people will change the world, President Benson said. And so the Lord is trying to change people. And Paul is trying to change people. That's what the gospel is for. And so can we have husbands and wives in a relationship of love and mutual respect? And we're not going to overturn the entire domestic system or social structure, but we'll be Christ-like within it. Paul is going to have to make a similar difficult compromise with slavery. And we'll talk more about that when we get to Philemon. But it's the same basic concept. Do we, do we dig down and put our foot in the ground and say, absolutely, we'll, we'll die on this hill. Well, you're going to die on it then. Because are you really going to be able to change that complete civilization-wide social structure? Or can we, as we saw Paul do repeatedly, talk to masters and slaves and try to become more Christ-like within the social institutions that are so deeply ingrained that we can't change those yet. We pray the day will come where there are sufficient Christians out there to allow Christianity to start affecting culture. But in the meantime, we're trying to live and hope that they'll let us live. Okay? Again, I, I, this seems so unsatisfying. I understand. I get it. This is a really, really difficult passage. It goes on and, and remains difficult because Paul is preaching to a, a Jewish and Gentile, now Christian audience. They share a belief in the Old Testament as they come into Christianity. That's their shared scripture. Paul's just writing new letters that later would become scripture. 
But notice what he says, because as he's trying to help them stay in some kind of Goldilocks zone, not overswing the pendulum, uh, I've taught some things about greater equality and I don't want to overswing. And so uh, how do I, uh, how do I not rub the Romans the wrong way? And how do I convince Christians? Well, I guess I'll have to draw upon our authoritative texts. And where can I go in scripture to caution? Well, here goes nothing. He turns to Adam and Eve. And brace yourself for this one, too. This is hard. He says, for, and this is to try to justify what he's been saying already. For Adam was first formed, and then Eve. So, as, in terms of the chronology of the creation, he's making some kind of argument for male preeminence. And then he gives another example. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding she, and the JST says they, so it's not just Eve, it's womanhood in general, shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. And I actually love the last four main terms in that passage because it shows that the focus is always supposed to be Christ-like attributes. And we've been seeing that throughout this whole letter. Okay, Remember, it's godliness and good works. It's a, it's a pure conscience. It is, it is charity and unfeigned faith. That's what we're after here. And so, sisters, that's the goal all along. Faith, charity, holiness, sobriety, seriousness, right? And your focus on the places that really matters. And this should apply to men as much as to women, that no other success can compensate for failure in the home. So, saved in childbearing. And again, that should apply to dads as well as moms, okay? Now, how do we deal with that? First of all, we have to deal with it in combination with every other verse we deal with. Do not cherry pick this and justify your male chauvinism if that's something you struggle with. Bring this into conversation and context with everything else that Paul has said, that Jesus has said, that Genesis says, that President Nelson has said and President Oaks have said. That, by the way, is one of the greatest gifts of continuous revelation and ongoing prophets and apostles because they can help us see how would we interpret these things in our day? Are we still being held to this first century standard? Or is that part of the law that has been fulfilled and no longer needs to be perpetuated? Okay? Or was that part of culture instead of part of commandment? That's a huge difference too. And so to have prophets and apostles in our day, do they talk like this? No. Think about the proclamation of the world and the family. And while there is a difference between the gender, it's a divine difference. And there is equality without equivalence. No equality ruins things. That's what been most of human history. But an equivalence ruins things too. And that, unfortunately, is kind of where we're moving in our day. So an equality without equivalence, with different roles, but equal partners in that. And the, uh, the flexibility for unique circumstances and situations to be dealt with in specific ways. The proclamation allows for all of that. Okay? It's, a, it's an inspired, inspired document. And to see that as our marching orders and our understanding of how we navigate Christianity and culture in our day, hold on to that great blessing. Bring that into conversation with this one. Because simply throwing Eve under the bus... I don't think was ever Paul's intention. In some ways, again, we discussed this when we studied Genesis last year. We've talked about it already in some of Paul's letters that have some tricky passages along these lines. In his letter to the Romans, he talked, and Corinthians, he talked about death coming on the world because of Adam. It doesn't, make, doesn't mention Eve. Here he has a different purpose, and so he's bringing, a, he's shining a light from a different angle. And it's an angle that we're not really comfortable with. And it's okay for us not to be comfortable with it. We shouldn't be. But here where it's like, well, chronology would suggest. And yet elsewhere Paul has said, there's no, there's no woman without the man. Thank you, Rib. But there's no man without the woman. Thank you, every mother who's ever existed throughout time. And so again, in the Lord, it's man and wife. 
It's husband and wife. It's man and woman, equal partners. It's got to be that way. So keep that in mind. And then when he says that the woman was deceived, we talked about that in an earlier passage where Paul talked about the woman being beguiled. And our greater understanding of the fall and its fortunate aspect and the wisdom and courage shown by Eve in partaking of the fruit, was she beguiled? Was she deceived? Well, only in part. She had her eyes open, but did she understand every consequence? We never do. As I said in that other discussion, did you know what you were getting yourself into when you got married? Well, of course. Ooh, not entirely. How about when you went on your mission? Oh, yeah, I, not, uh, not all the way. Did you know what you were getting yourself into when you had kids? Oh, yeah, not 100%. How about when you accepted the plan of salvation? And we shouted for joy. And then came to earth and wondered what all the shouting was about. We know in part. We see through a glass darkly. Later we'll get it. And so according to everything she did know, Eve had the courage to step forward. There were some things that she couldn't have known until she experienced them. And it's there that the adversary works to beguile, to deceive. And as we've said before also, if anything... What Eve did wrong was to make a unilateral decision whose consequences were anything but unilateral, right? She made a choice that affected Adam as much as it affected Eve, but Eve made it on her own without Adam and the two of them coming together on this. Are there similar things happening in Ephesus? Finding this freedom in Christ, this equality in Christ? Have they taken it too far? Again, those are possibilities that we don't know for sure. Uh, I've, I've said this before. I'll say it again here. When it comes to gender issues, and I would add, in anticipation of our discussion in Philemon, I would add in racial issues. In gender and race, Christian history has been the long and painful process of catching back up to Jesus. And in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, when it comes to racial and gender issues, our history has been the long, well, not quite as long, but the long and painful process of catching back up to Joseph Smith, who was so far ahead of his time in empowering the Relief Society in ways that even the sisters weren't totally ready for, and in giving a priest, ordaining African-American men to the priesthood, even though Missouri and America in general was not ready for that at all. It, it, again, historically, I wish we had the time to really dig into all of the details, but historically, it doesn't work to work from the outside in. It forces things onto people that they, oh, might externally bow to, but internally over their dead body. And there's no internal change to accept the outward alterations. Think about Jim Crow in post-Civil War South. And though slavery was outlawed, racism couldn't be. And because it was forced upon them, the Southerners absolutely refused to change anything internally. Well, fine, give them the right to vote. We won't ever let them exercise it. And it's a, a century's worth of horrific history. And what they hoped to solve in the 1860s only started to be solved in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Act. Martin Luther King got it. It has to be internal things. We have to work on the hearts of people and change their, their, their minds and their hearts and their consciences so that they want a change. Changed people change the world. Martin Luther King got it. President Benson got it. Jesus got it. I hope we get it too. I'm, I'm sorry if this feels still somewhat unsatisfying. This is a really hard passage. Again, I, well, we thank the O God for a prophet and for prophets who can clarify and confirm and simply teach truth in our day that helps, helps us navigate a modern culture that in some ways has made significant progress from the old days, but also has yet significant progress to be made. Okay. With that, let's turn the page to chapter 3 
And here we're back to business with Timothy as a, as a bishop. And how do I do this? And we're, we're getting some hints of how is the church supposed to run. We're going to get some more details here. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. <laughs> and it is work, that's for sure. I laugh sometimes, like, desire it? Who would want that? Anybody who aspires to position, well, you get what you deserve, right? And it's work, work, work. But what a glorious work it is. Sweet is the work. Yes, every bishop I've served with and talked to, there's a mantle, and it's heavy. But it also, wow, it warms the soul, and it expands, expands the heart in beautiful ways. He describes a bishop in these terms. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. In other words, worthy of your sustaining vote. That's the kind of person, how could you not want to follow them? Now, I know some of you bishops out there, though, are looking at this and thinking, I'm disqualified from the very start then, the very first qualification I lack. Blameless? Are you kidding me? I'm not perfect, and you don't have to be. Don't forget the mercy that Paul extended to Timothy in the very opening salutation. Don't forget that Aaron's rod belongs under the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. Blameless doesn't mean flawless. You'll never be that. If prophets weren't promised infallibility, then bishops certainly weren't guaranteed perfection either. But in what areas can I be blameless? Um, having my heart in the right place? Loving my members? Doing whatever it is in my power to lead and lift and love anywhere that I can? I have served with and under and have been served by so many blameless bishops when it comes to that. Such a beautiful description. And then just go through the other qualifications. The husband of one wife. Now, in, during the plural marriage days, they definitely had to qualify that, right? But husband of one wife in terms of you're chaste, you're virtuous. There's no immorality, adultery going on. And that was true even in the plural marriage days. That was, that was, this was not license for lasciviousness. It was anything but. So these are good husbands. Vigilant, so they're watchful. They're quick to observe. They, they have that discerning eye to seek out those who are most in need. Sober. This isn't <laughs> just avoiding alcohol. This is taking their responsibilities incredibly seriously. Now, they can have a good time. I've had a lot of uh, bishops that are just a blast, but especially as they're responsible for youth, right? But sober, they know when to take serious things seriously. Of good behavior, that, that's self-explanatory. Given to hospitality is a beautiful one. Of just, I've seen bishops open their homes to board members and youth activities and firesides and just they become the, the, the bishop's heart is the, the home of the ward. They're given to hospitality and apt to teach, looking, every, looking for every opportunity to teach, to train. Oh, bishops are amazing along those lines. The list continues in verse 3. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, Again, think about this list. You're, there's, this is a man of self-control, of self-discipline. He's not going to be guilty of priestcraft or grow impatient with the people they're trying to help. No, this is one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, that's a tricky one. And even in non-Latter-day Saint circles, when I was in divinity school, you'd meet people and they'd say, oh yeah, I was a PK. And I'm like, a PK? Oh, oh, that's a preacher kid, a preacher's kid. And, and there's a certain stereotype that goes along with it that, you know, if you're the preacher's kid, you're usually like the hellion of the congregation. And everyone's like, oh man. Uh, and then yet there's others that are, oh, I felt the pressure of being the preacher's kid. And I'm trying to live up to the expectation everybody has for my, for my parent. Well, for any bishop out there, for anyone serving the Lord who feels that of all the places they struggle, that is a particularly sensitive spot, 
my heart goes out to you. And please know that he can't possibly mean that any parent with a struggling child is, do, is disqualified from church service because then Lehi can't be a prophet and Alma the elder can't be and God can't be since he has children who struggle too. It's a matter of ruling well his own house. But that's not, that rule is not a tyrannical one. It's one that still honors agency. It's one that follows all the principles laid out in section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And so it's persuasion and it's meekness and it's love unfeigned. It's doing everything within your power, but then honoring agency. Remember the JST of that previous verse. God is willing that everyone be saved. He wants us all to come home, but he will force no man to heaven. And bishops cannot force their children to behave. Or they'd end up forcing their ward members to do likewise, and that doesn't work either. Don't forget that line in DNC 121 about all those Christ-like attributes. It guards against hypocrisy. Interesting. I used to think that that was the bishops or the, the priesthood holders hypocrisy that you're being guarded, guarded against. Actually, I think it's the hypocrisy or potential hypocrisy of the person being led. Because if I'm leading not out of persuasion, meekness and gentleness and long suffering, if I'm leading out of, again, tyr if I'm leading tyrannically, oh, they'll obey, but they'll obey hypocritically. So by simply trying my best to be persuasive and loving and kind, then when they choose to obey, it will be their choice and there will be no hypocrisy. Okay, that is something I think bishops and all of us can work on overcoming is any kind of unrighteous dominion and ruling in the right way. Paul adds to the list, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he falls into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Several ways to fall into the devil's snare there. There's the dual dangers of being loved too much and being loved too little, or hated too much, you could say. I mean, if you're a novice and all of a sudden, like, wow, I, I, I don't even know what I'm doing, but everyone like looks at me like I'm their leader, it's amazing. That, that's kind of heady stuff. That can go straight to the head. And we start thinking it's about us instead of about the position and the responsibilities that it entails. So uh, don't be so immature in your faith that you think it's all about you. Don't let it lift you up to pride. And then the other part of have a good report of those that are without. How do you treat people outside the faith? I mean, it's interesting that in a geographic situation where ever the, ward, the world is broken up into wards and bishops are over this geographic area, not only for the members, but for the non-members as well. And so be of good report to those that are outside the church. Maybe that's part of living in peace with your neighbors as well, like we saw at the beginning of chapter 2. Now, if that's the counsel for bishops in the first seven verses, he then shifts gears and looks to the deacons. And I'm not thinking 11 and 12-year-olds. We're in, in the early church, deacons were people who handled them, most of the temporal affairs of the church. Remember, Melchizedek priesthood is responsible for spiritual things primarily, and Aaronic priesthood is responsible for temporal things primarily. There's some other ways to divide and conquer with those two as well. But this division of labor is for deacons to help oh, run the day-to-day -day affairs of the congregation. And so counsel for them, verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, so they've got the same kind of self-discipline. Uh, they're trustworthy. They're, and you need to be, especially if you're handling temporal things. They're, they're just like the bishops are in their sphere of influence. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So there seem to be proving grounds and preparing grounds. And to serve in this calling might be a good preparation for serving in, in a, as a bishop later on but to be trustworthy and blameless and pure in conscience either way. In verse 11, even so must their wives be grave. So there's a sense of when a, when a person is called, well, the whole couple is called. And you wives of, of bishops know exactly what that feels like. So the wives must also be serious, be grave, not slanderers. 
sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree, or other translations, an excellent standing, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. I think there's something powerful about that boldness, having confidence in their faith so that others can have confidence in them. I trust in God so I can be trusted by my neighbor. Paul says in verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So, again, he's been transferred to Macedonia, and, Paul, and Timothy's still back in, in Ephesus. I really hope to come back as quickly as I can. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, that's a beautiful description. On the one hand, it's, I, just, I want you to know what to do in my absence. And I was always grateful. I remember, I've been in three different bishoprics, and I always preferred being second counselor instead of first. And when I, whenever I was called to be first, I'd always tell that to the second counselor. He's like, why? It's like, you outrank me. And I'm like, yeah, but the problem is, I, I'm your line of defense. I don't have one. I mean, two people have to be absent before the buck stops with you. Me, anytime the bishop's out of town, I'm the, I'm the go-to guy. And I, I, I don't want that responsibility. And we'd laugh. But here, I want, if in Paul's absence, Timothy needs to know how to behave himself. But to behave in the house of God, in the church of God. And the way it's described, the church of the living God, it's then said it's the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, that, I love the description. Uh, if it's the, the pillar, it's what lifts things up it's the, and holds them up. If it's the ground, it's where we're grounded. But careful, it's not the church that does that. The church is simply scaffolding. The kingdom of God is with us and within us and among us. It's the family of God we're trying to edify. So what's up with the church? There's actually a Joseph Smith translation of this that makes it clear that it's Jesus we're talking about here, not the church of Jesus Christ. It, in fact, it just changes the word is and phrases it, the pillar and ground of the truth is and then verse 16 follows. So he's not referring to the church as the pillar and ground. What is it that bears us up? What is it that grounds us on solid, on solid earth? Well, 16 answers that. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So the pillar and ground of the truth is this particular mystery. And the only thing that makes it mysterious is you'll never figure this out on pure rationalism alone. It has to be revealed to you and confirmed to you by the Spirit of God. And that's a great thing. And this is a great mystery. But what does the mystery entail? Keep reading. God was manifest in the flesh. That's the word made flesh that we saw in John chapter 1. That God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. So live that perfect life where the Spirit could justify everything He ever did. He was seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is such a beautiful summary of the gospel. That's the good news. Extra, extra, read all about it. In its simplest form, that's the mystery of godliness. How do we become godly? Well, believe in that message. Have faith in that truth that the Word was made flesh, lived a perfect life, was still in tune with, with heaven the whole time, seen of angels, and now preached, so the world can come to know Him and believe in Him. He that was received up into glory and who will someday return to share that glory with us all. That's the mystery. Tap into that. Now, with that, he ends chapter 3. And chapter 4, he picks up right where he left off to talk about, well, Timothy's call to serve. You saw the qualifications in the last chapter. Are you ready to go? Are you prepared to do this, Timothy? You better be, because here's what you're up against. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, or clearly, or distinctly. This is something the Lord really wants us to understand. Okay, so you ready? That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, to the Thessalonian saints, Paul clarified that there would be a falling away first. To the Ephesian saints, there was a sense of being tossed to and fro. Paul has repeatedly warned of coming apostasies, and here he does it again. This one's specifically referring to that that's taking place in the last days. That in those latter times, yeah, people will depart from the faith. And if we haven't noticed, that's been happening. The, the pastor in me, it breaks my heart and I want to help. The historian in me sits back with a little clinical distance and says, oh, well, right on time. And Jesus said it would be this way. Paul said it would be this way. And guess what? It is this way. And why? Because people are giving heed. Think about what Nephi said about those in the great and spacious building. How do you overcome them? By ignoring them. You st- they have no power. They're not doing commando runs across the river and pulling people away from the tree of life. No, they're just pointing fingers and mocking. And we're choosing to drop the fruit out of shame and head off in their direction. They have no power to remove us from the tree, but we give heed to them and end up following. That's what Nephi said. You could tell the ones that stayed by the tree because they heeded them not. They wouldn't listen to those at the great and spacious building. Seducing spirits, think about that where it's just seductive, trying to lure you away. And devilish doctrines Oh, like moral relativism? And yet that's the Kool-Aid everybody's drinking these days? We've got to be careful about those doctrines of devils. No wonder Paul has been so emphatic with Timothy. Keep the doctrine pure. I think tragically, when he speaks of lies in hypocrisy, there are people who attack us that know better. And to me it's tragic as I sometimes watch anti-Mormon videos as part of my own research agenda to understand what they're saying, how they're, where they're coming from, that there is, I'm not going to call names and point fingers like that, but sometimes when I hear them describe church history and they're bringing up all the things they accuse the church of leaving out of the narrative, and yet they are leaving out all the rest, they all, they're so selective in terms of what they present. And that is speaking lies in hypocrisy because they know better. They know their history better than that. But what about that conscience? Seared with a hot iron? How's that for past feeling? Imagine a cauterized conscience where it's been so burned and then scarred over that it no longer feels any twinge of remorse when it's guilty of these kinds of sins. Well, what are they preaching throughout it all? Look at verse 3. Forbidding to marry... And commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now most of that verse was just referring back to that idea about food. And as long as you are receiving it with thanksgiving and gratitude, then it's okay. Remember, we're past the kosher laws. Circumcision no longer required. Kosher laws no longer apply. I mean, there's some elements there about food offered to idols. We want to steer clear of that. But the idolatry is the problem, not the food. So what he's getting at here is some of these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, it's, it's more subtle. I mean, he gave us the long list on the first one about people who really needed law, right? And it's like, oh, man stealers and, and, and murderers of parents. And like, wow, that's serious stuff. Just forbidding to marry or telling people to abstain from meat? That doesn't sound like a big deal. Well, maybe that's what makes it more seductive or more devilish. It's so much more subtle. Because there were these rival sects, these little religious groups that felt like they were superior to the Christians because they were more ascetic. They practiced lifelong celibacy. They had much more strict dietary laws And so Christianity, oh, that's just a watered-down version of things. You're not disciples at all. 
And like I've said before, most people who leave the church leave it because they believe too little. But some people leave the church because they believe too much. It's the opposite side of the Goldilocks zone. And instead of apathy, it's overzealousness. And instead of too cold, it's too hot. That's the case here. Uh, celibacy for those who are not married or at this stage of life cannot be, or for whatever reason, that's just not an option. Celibacy is the greatest good. That's morality. But to establish that as the norm, there goes the eternal family. Now, Satan wants to destroy the eternal family at all costs. And by and large, he prefers to move people in the direction of immorality. But for those that would never fall prey to that extreme, oh, fine, I'll just go around the other side and push you in the opposite direction. I don't care if you fall off the straight and narrow to the left or the right. <laughs> Either way, you fall. And so we'll go in that direction. And then same thing with meats. It's one thing to be guilty of gluttony. It's another thing to, be, to, to push for some kind of an, uh, abstention from all meat. Even the word of wisdom sp strikes a middle ground here. Okay? And again, if we're talking about Jewish offshoots that or the ones that spin their endless genealogies, right? And their rabbinic fables. And, and that, they're the ones that are pushing for, a, for celibacy and uh, abstaining from all these kinds of meats. They're putting the kosher laws on steroids. In this case, Paul is simply saying, that's unnecessary. Kosher laws, in fact, if you really think about it, my Jewish Christian friends, it was never about what you were eating or not eating. It was always about remembering God. Because yeah, is, is there anything technically wrong with most of the things that were forbidden us? No. But if you had to, if the law was so specific and strict uh, that you had to go study the book of Leviticus every time you went out to dinner, <laughs> you're going to remember God. We, how do we do that? Not by the strictness of what we can or cannot eat, by and large, but rather receiving all things with thanksgiving. If I, that's one of the reasons I pray before food, it, before meals. It's not just to bless the food, like it's something's wrong and it's physical. No, it's more of a mental, spiritual reminder to be grateful and to think of God before every meal. In verse 6, Paul says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And that's all Timothy ever wanted. He would be nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And again, nourished yourself allows you to nourish other people. Give them the word of faith. Teach them good doctrine. As opposed to, it's opposite, refuse profane and old wives' fables. The phrase old wives' tales is still popular in our day. Well, it was popular back in Paul's too. He didn't make it up. That was just kind of the stereotypical, oh, it's an old wives' fable. That's an irreverent fiction. That's a silly myth. So refuse those. Instead, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And then he does a little play on words on that word exercise and says, well, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. I mean, the gospel is the ultimate workout, after all, right? And exercise here could be translated to train or to discipline yourself. It actually comes from the Greek word gymnazo, and that's where we get gym, and gymnasium. So, are you going to hit the gym? Well, which kind? It's less about physical exercise and more about spiritual exercise. Now, this is not to say anything against physical exercise. We need that too. That's part of the word of wisdom as well that we sometimes underappreciate. But think about what he said earlier about women with their gold and pearls and broided hair. And are you just doing it to be seen of other people? Because if so, it would be better to array yourself in good works. Godliness is what you should be after, he said then. Here, more for the guys. You hit in the gym? Why? So people can see how strong you are physically. Oh, the spiritual strength is the one that matters most. And so what you should you be exercising? How about godliness? Oh, your, your rippling muscles will, may make you look good in this life, but godliness will make you truly good in both this life and the life to come. 
In verse 9, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, which he said previously about other things. But, so, but again, here is something true worth holding on to and worth sharing. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Those are the most important truths you could ever share, Timothy. Those are the ones worth teaching, worth accepting, worth commanding and obeying, worth working for and suffering for. So teach those things, Timothy. And while you're at it, verse 12, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And I love that list. Those are the kinds of examples we all need to set. How we talk, there's our word. How we behave, that's our conversation. How we love, that's our charity. How we worship, uh, there's our spirit. How we believe, there's our faith. How we obey, there's our purity. Are those the examples we're setting? Or are we only selective in which examples we set? Timothy, strive for that kind of blamelessness and set a good example all across the board. And don't wait until you're older, thinking it's just going to be easier then, and oh, nobody takes me seriously now anyway. Well, that's the problem. And that's on them, not on you. When he says, let no man despise thy youth, it's such a powerful statement, because Timothy was a young church leader, a junior companion, Paul's beloved son in the faith. And too often, it's... It's easy to look, to look over the head of young people because they're little. And we look down on them in more ways than one. We don't give them much responsibility. It's one of the reasons that we're losing many of our young adults. Because the Lord trusted them with everything when they were out in the mission field. And then they come home and we don't think they're ready for any challenging callings. Oh, they're ready, all right. Ask YSA wards and stakes. And those young single adults are running the show. It's amazing. Despise seems a little strong. I don't hate little kids. Well, despise is a bad translation then. The, the Greek would suggest more of a think less of. In Spanish, it'd be something like menospreciar, to appreciate less. To undervalue or underestimate. That's a good way to describe it. Don't let anyone underestimate you just because you're young. And I love that, having spent most of my life with young people that I look up to, not down on. One oh, quick story. When I was on my mission, my mission, I was serving in the office, and the mission president said, we've got a big transfer coming up, and we're going to need a second van to run the transfers. We ha already had one. It was a mission van, but we're going to need a second one. So he said, go down to the airport, because that's the best place for car rental. Rent a, one of those big 15-passenger vans and bring it back so we can do transfer. I said, yes, sir. And I headed off to the airport in San Juan. Uh, by then, I was nearing the end of my mission. I felt like I could do anything. And I went there and went to Hertz Rent-A-Car and looked at the person across and said, no, I need a van, and we're going all through this in Spanish. And we're filling out the paperwork, and then they asked me for my ID, so I handed them my driver's license. They looked at it for a second, and then she said, oh, lo siento. I'm sorry. You're not old enough to rent a van. And I'm like, what? I'm 21. Doesn't that make everything legal? And she's like, no, uh, it's, sorry, you have to be, I can't remember the age, like 24 or something. Insurance companies or rental companies, whatever, they, they're more serious about that. And so you have to be older. And I was in total disbelief because I realized if they don't budge on this, then how are we going to do transfers? Well, we're still going to need a van, but that means the mission president someone has to go drive out to the airport. And I don't want to, I'm trying to save him that, that work. He was trying to save himself. He sent me on this mission. And so I was just like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm, I'm old enough. I can do this. I, I'm trustworthy. And she's like, I'm sorry. The policy is you have to be older. And I, I like snapped. And I looked at this poor, probably minimum wage worker, and I just unloaded on her. And I said in Spanish, you mean to tell me that I left my home 
traveled 4,000 miles to a place I'd never been, speaking a language I didn't know, telling people twice my age to join my church to change their lives, and you don't think I'm old enough to rent a van? It came out like fire. And she was like, ah, lo siento. No, it's not my, my decision. And she was right. It wasn't on her. It was policy. So I turned about and went back to the mission president to explain the problem. But the whole time I was driving back to the mission office, I, it, it hit me. God trusts me with his kingdom. And Hertz won't give me a van? Seriously? I'm, I'm amazed at how well God takes this advice. He never underestimates the young. He calls a 14-year-old Joseph Smith, a 25-year-old Captain Moroni, a 10-year-old Mormon. He calls a young Esther to be queen and a young Mary to be a chosen vessel. He chooses a young David and a boy Samuel and stripling warriors. He gives priesthood power to 11-year-olds and invites sons and daughters to receive the Spirit of God, to be witnesses of priesthood ordinances, to work for the salvation of the living and the dead. He sends out 18 and 19 year olds to places in the world that they've never been in languages they haven't can't speak. It's crazy. I think in some ways God's emphasis on the youth is his way of telling the devil, I can beat you with both hands tied behind my back. I'll beat you with kids. <laughs> and what's interesting about that, not only does God never underestimate the young, neither does the devil. That's why the adversary is working so hard on the youth and young adults of the church. He knows their great potential. Do we? Do we trust them with it to do great things? Or do we still do everything for them? As Elder Maxwell once warned us, to do everything for, you've almost done them in. Let them lead. Let them fail so they can learn from those failures. Just give them opportunities and then get out of their way. It's amazing what the youth of the church will be able to accomplish. When God, changes the, when it, God wants to change the world, what does he do? He has a baby born. And he doesn't wait long to put that newborn to work. With that in mind, what advice, what counsel would Paul give young Timothy? Verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, I mean, this sounds like really, really good mission prep, doesn't it? <laughs> Go read. Go exhort and receive exhortation. Study the doctrine so you know how to keep it pure. Paul says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. These, these are, this is your setting apart blessing. This is your patriarchal blessing. These are your spiritual gifts. Live into those. Lean into them. Don't neglect them. In my own patriarchal blessing, he lists some spiritual gifts that have been promised me, and then he says, these are your blessings. I really wish there was a period right there, but there isn't. It's a comma. And then it says, and you must claim them. Like, ah, darn it. How do I do that? Well, don't neglect them. Exercise faith in the promises you've been given. And when you were set apart, remember earlier on in this letter, there was that, that nudge or that, that reminder to Timothy You've been told some things. You've been, been prophesied about some things. You were made for this calling. So live into it. Neglect it not. Along those lines, he says, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. It'll be easy for them to sustain you when they see that level of preparation within you. They will not underestimate you when they see how, just how seriously you've taken this calling. Take heed unto thyself, Paul says, and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. That is about as powerful a charge as anyone could get when they're called to serve. Ways to prepare, 
Live up to your gifts and promised blessings. Think about it. Give it all you've got. Watch yourself. Know the doctrine. Live the gospel. Oh, and not only will you make it, but so will everyone you serve. There's power that comes when we see the potential of our opportunities to serve. Every calling can be magnified. And to take it seriously along those lines, to think about it a little more, meditate upon these things, develop the spiritual gifts required to be able to serve in these callings. The Lord has great expectations of all of us, especially the young. Compared to Him, we're all young. So don't let it, don't, don't underestimate yourself. Do these things and you'll be ready for anything. Now, specifically, are there particular things I need to be ready for? Timothy's probably wondering. Okay, this, these are amazing general instructions. You got anything specific for me? And Paul does in chapter 5. This one is going to be about caring for those in need which is going to be a major challenge as well. This is a small church, and so do we even have enough to care for our own? Well, as the bishop here, you're responsible not only for their spiritual welfare, but for their temporal too. Get the deacons to help, okay? But keep an eye out for those who need assistance. Chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. This sounds like Nephi. Remember that case when Lehi complained about the broken bow and I, I can't provide for my family. I'm the responsible one and I can't find food. Nobody can. Well, how does Nephi respond? Does he rebuke him? Does he say, come on, dad, where's your faith? No, he acts as if his father still had faith. I'm sure down deep he still does and asks him for direction on where to go. I'll let the Lord rebuke you if that's what you need. But no, I will entreat you as a father. In Nephi's case, that came naturally. <laughs> if that's how you're supposed to treat older men, how about younger? The younger men, treat them as brethren. The elder women as mothers. The younger as sisters, with all purity. And I love the thought that we're treating fellow saints like family. Okay, Family, I've heard it said that family are the people who put up with you when no one else will. <laughs> okay, It's like, ah, well, we're stuck. But I'm here for you, come what may. Whether or not you deserve it, I'm, I'm all in. Okay, And so... We're going to start talking about providing for those in need, but we need to couch it all in a family kind of context. So treat each other like fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, treat each other with purity, and then honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite or repay their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now, what's he saying here? We're moving into the direction of providing for the poor. And who needs more help than widows? We saw that repeatedly in the Old Testament and earlier in the New Testament, where the Lord has a special spot in his heart for widows. Because in the ancient world, when women could not do much to provide for themselves, if you lost your husband and had no sons, no brothers, no father, you, are, you really are alone in the world at the mercy of others. Well, here, what does Paul mean by honoring widows that are widows indeed? Hmm, that suggests that there are some widows who aren't really widows? What's that all about? Well, he hinted at it. If there's a widow that still has children or nephews, and by that it can just mean extended family, it could be grandkids, it could be nieces, nephews, whatever. If you still have family, turn to them first. And let those extended family members, let those kids show a little piety, huh? Your mother gave everything to you. Return the favor. If your father has passed on, take care of your mother. You should have the heart to do that, however many means you have to do it. Along those lines, he says in verse 5, Now she that is a widow indeed, and again, I don't want to take anything away from any widow because any loss of a loved one is devastating. But here we're talking abject poverty and total desolation. What are we going to do to help them? We're talking a widow with no other possibility for support. So a widow indeed and desolate. Who does she rely on? Well, there's only one option. She trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. I mean, there's nobody else to rely on. So, of course, it's going to be God she turns to. He's the only one 
She's got. There is no one else. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. I mean, yeah, she might be temporally alive, but she's spiritually dead. Now, compared to that, a righteous widow is the reverse. Temporally dying, but spiritually alive. And to those spiritually faithful, alive, vibrant women, we've got to provide for them temporally so they can survive. Paul says to Timothy, These things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Think about that. Because even infidels take care of their own. It's like what Jesus said about publicans at the end of Matthew chapter 5. If you only love those that love you, even publicans can do that. And poor Matthew, the publican, is writing that down. Like, he's right. I mean, even I can do that. You understand? We've got to take care of our own. And for Timothy, that's absolutely essential. Because how are you going to use the incredibly limited financial resources of the church? Here, he explains in verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number. And the number he's referring to is the number of those who are going to receive church support. There's a, a list and we can only fit so many names on it because we only have so many resources. So who should we... Who should we put on that number to receive the kind of fast offerings, for example, that we could provide? Here's his qualifications. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. If she's less than 60, there may be some hope for her still. And that's tricky because in the ancient world, 60, not not a lot of people made it that far. Okay, But he's drawing an age cutoff first. I imagine there's probably a lot of wiggle room on that, but that's got to start somewhere. He then adds some additional qualifications. Having been the wife of one man, so again, think of her in terms of virtuous and chaste throughout her life. Well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, the JST changes that to wash the saints' clothes since washing the feet actually is an an ordinance within the priesthood, whereas washing saints' clothing is an act of charity and service that we could all perform. If she have relieved the afflicted, another one open to us, if she have diligently followed every good work, this description is starting to sound a little like the bishop himself. Have you been a good bishop? Bishop, how about you? Have you been a widow that has been... Righteous. Again, we are... In the ancient world, there is only so much to go around. And you do have the occasional wealthy patroness like a Lydia, the seller of purple. But so many, it is the lowly and the humble that are turning to the Lord in hopes that He will provide for them as only He can. So I don't know how much money is being coming into the tithing envelope. How many fast offerings are being extended? And so what is Timothy going to draw upon to meet people's needs? The idea here is when there are limited resources, give it to those who need it most and who have lived a life such that they are eminently deserving. If we have more, we can, we can extend the parameters, obviously. But these are the types of people that would have been contributing to others all along the way. They've cast their bread upon the waters. Now, many days later, it needs to return to them. They deserve that. Paul says in verse 11, But the younger widows refuse. I'm sorry, sisters. I, everything you've gone through, this would have been hard to follow. But I have to draw the line somewhere. I can't, if I give to you, then I'm not giving to someone who has no other options. If you're younger, you might still have hope to find a new companion. He says, younger women refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. And that's, that's kind of strong language too, but there's a sense of, well, if it's physical appetite that is drawing them toward a remarriage, then, then fine, let them marry, be my guest. Remember, this is Paul who had talked earlier about marrying the ministry if you're a widow 
It's like, don't get remarried. Stay like me. I'm a widower. And I just, I, I'm married to my ministry and it's 24 seven and there's no reason to go home. And I just go, 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 go. You'll be amazing missionaries if you can do the same. Well, uh, not everybody's going to do that. And God's okay with that. And Paul was okay with it too. Remember, he just said, that's counsel. It's not a commandment. That's just my advice to you. Here, similar advice. There are some who will get married. Fine, let them get married. If they're doing it, though, by waxing wanton against Christ, and it's lust that's drawing them into marriage, ooh, the next line, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Where's your faith? Didn't you trust that the Lord would provide? And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. And that sounds familiar from what we studied last week in Thessalonians. Just busybodies instead of busy bodies trying to provide for themselves. If you're young enough to be able to do that, if you are faithful enough and trust in God, He will provide, and the church will provide for you too. I'm just worried about those that are doing things for the wrong reasons. And people that are going around from bishop to bishop asking for fast offerings when they have no intention of doing good things with them, that never contributed but only want to take. Oh, I remember what he said to the Thessalonians, if you don't work, you don't eat, when it comes to the communal meal. We have to be careful with this, obviously. There's a Goldilocks zone here, too. But this is on the justice side of things. I think the mercy side would come naturally for someone like Timothy. Well, verse 14, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Uh, But the ones that haven't, the ones that are faithful, oh, you have all the hope in the world to start anew and to begin again with marriage and family and pick up and put back together the pieces of your life. It's not over. God has, like I said, a sweet spot in his heart for people who have gone through these kinds of difficulties. We never hear of Joseph again after Jesus as a 12-year-old in the temple. The thought most likely is that He passed away before Jesus began his mortal ministry, which means throughout it all, Mary, Mother Mary, would have been a widow. Of course, Jesus would have a a loving place for her and for anyone like her. But if you're young enough, I want to give you everything that you feel you have lost. Begin again. But then verse 16, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, Let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So again, that goes back to this idea. Provide for your own. Why? So the church can provide for those who are truly forsaken. Turn to your family. We we even do this in church welfare today. Family first as resource. From there, we we can turn to the church. But we need to be there for each other. In verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. This is an idea of providing for those who are serving full time in the ministry. Remember, Paul never accepted that, but it's, it was an option. And there's nothing wrong with that because, again, how else are they going to provide for themselves? In some ways, they are a, the equivalent of a widow because they, their job has died, so to speak. Does that make sense? Their opportunity to, to have an income and be provided for, that's no longer an option for them because they are giving full-time service to the Lord. Paul decided to remain somewhat married to his old profession, his tent making, so he could put food on his own, his own table. But for those that choose not to, give them that portion. Let them who are laboring in the word and the doctrine be provided for. And then he quotes some scripture. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's Deuteronomy 25.4. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. And that's Luke 10 verse 7. Which is interesting because Luke hasn't been written yet. So that must have been a saying of Jesus that was well enough known that Paul could quote it here from memory. And that Luke could quote it and put it in his gospel when he comes down to write. Interesting. Okay. 
Then in verse 19, against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. I mean, if this is an elder who's lived his life and has contributed to the kingdom and served in callings and done his best, then give them the benefit of the doubt. They've earned it, after all. If they're accused, fine, but this is innocent until proven guilty. Where are the witnesses, two or three, to establish the reality of what they're being accused of? Now, if it's right and true and it has happened, then fine. Them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. And the idea there is, if this person was in a a publicly visible position and they sinned, then unfortunately the discipline needs to occur publicly as well. That way people will know where the church stands on this kind of behavior. Okay? Uh, that's, typically the church wants to avoid that for the person's sake. We're not trying to drag you through the, the, through the coals. We're not trying to make you a public example. But if you were a public persona and your sins are now known to everyone, then the discipline has to be known to everyone as well so they see where we stand. Paul then says, I charge thee before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So, please, Timothy, don't be a respecter of persons. No one is above the law. And so if you see someone in your congregation, high or low, you need to honor the worth of souls. That's half of the equation. But you need to protect the sanctity of the sacraments. That's the other. So, how are you going to meet out church resources? How are you going to meet out church discipline? This is the church handbook instructions. This is the shepherd's guide. Learn to lead and learn well, young Timothy. And then Paul brings this chapter to a close. Verse 22 to 25. Lay hands suddenly on no man. And that could probably be interpreted both positively or negatively. If it's negative, yeah, don't lay your hands on somebody suddenly. Don't jump to conclusions like they've done something wrong. But more positively, don't lay hands on them either in terms of giving them a calling and setting them apart. If you don't really know that's what the Lord wants them to do, or those are the blessings He really wants to provide, don't lay your hands suddenly. Be prepared to speak on behalf of the Lord. Next piece of advice. Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. You've got to be different than those around you, Timothy. You can't follow the crowd in a wrong direction. Okay. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, that's an odd piece of advice. It seems really, really specific to Timothy here. They've been mission companions so long. Did, did Paul know that Timothy had some digestive issues? Uh, It was a matter of, oh yeah, some of the places we've served, the water was not safe to drink. And I saw how it affected you. I got a stomach of steel, evidently. But you, man, there were some frequent infirmities there. So you might need to drink a little wine instead. I mean, not enough that it becomes a matter of indulgence. I remember I talked about sobriety before. We're not getting drunk here. But I wonder, especially in the ancient world where you didn't know where bacteria was coming from, some wine, would the fermentation kill that bacteria? Was it a a medicinal purpose in drinking this wine from time to time? Whatever it is, it sure does seem specifically directed at Timothy for his particular situation. And then some more general advice. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. And some men, they follow after. Likewise, also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. And what he means by that is, you know, as you're passing judgment, some sins are so obvious. It's like they come into view before the person actually does. You see sin before you even see sinner. It's that clear. Yeah, help them overcome those things. There's others that the the sins are harder to find. They're, They're trailing behind somewhere. But keep an eye out for that, and you can help people overcome those ones too. And the same is true on the opposite, on the good side. Some people's good is so beautifully blatant. Oh, you can't hide it and you wouldn't want to. They're letting their light so shine and the glory is going to God. Okay. Paul, I mean, excuse me, Timothy, you'll meet both kinds and be a discerning bishop and you'll know what to do. He then gives him one last chapter and the focal point here is coming back to godliness. 
I've taught you about true doctrine. I've taught you about multiple ways about how the adversary is at work and so guard against Satan. But one of the ways he, he does it is by pulling us away from godliness into material gain. I guess on the heels of our conversation about widows and how much do we have to provide, some people don't have plenty to provide, but they're spending it all on themselves. And that we need to guard against. So, last piece of advice in this first letter. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. We've seen in multiple letters Paul give counsel to husbands and wives, to parents and children, and to masters and servants. And here he's doing that. Servants, if you have a master that's worthy of honor, then give him that honor. Okay? They that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, in other letters, Paul does a better job of including counsel to the masters in terms of how you treat your servants. Here, it's, it's, it's more one-sided, unfortunately. And I don't know if he just forgot the other half or whatever, but it's, or our Timothy has been around for the other letters and you know the other side of things. Were there more servants? Is it, was it a bigger problem in Ephesus? Perhaps. But the counsel there is, if your master is a, a disciple, treat him like a disciple of Christ. Be a Christian servant to that Christian master. Again, the opposite we would hope is it's reciprocal. In verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, that's our focal point all along, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. I mean, long list of concerns that Paul has there, but it all boils down to what's godly? What are you seeking in life? What are you after? Those that say that, God, that gain is godliness, ooh, that's a problem. Because if that's what's most important to you, I mean, treasures on earth, then you'll do anything to acquire them. Whereas laying up treasures in heaven, where moth and rust doth not corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal, that's where, if that's where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be too. I'm worried about those whose heart is in the wrong place because their treasure is in the wrong place. Because if that happens, what do we end up doing? Well, pride pushes us. The strife. I mean, so much of what he, wor he, he warned Timothy about in that passage has to do with contention and disputation. And you'd think that that would be easy to come by between masters and servants, especially if the master becomes so greedy that he treats his servant merely as a means of enriching himself. Oh, this, this gain... That's godliness. No, it's not. I wonder how those who peddle the prosperity gospel get around this verse, supposing that gain is godliness. The prosperity, the so-called prosperity gospel is this oh, counterfeit of the law of the harvest. It's a counterfeit that says, hey, if, you, if you're good, then God will bless you. And he wants to bless you with all kinds of temporal blessings. In fact, look at me, your super rich pastor, and there they are with all of the world's material goods to try to prove what a good person they are. I do worry that some of that has even seeped into Latter-day Saint culture. That if God blesses the righteous, then if I can look blessed, then I hopefully will appear righteous. i got to keep up with the Joneses either way. And Paul's caution here, no. Godliness is gain. But gain is not godliness. And the kind of gain we're focused on is the heavenly kind, not the temporal. That just tends to lead to strifes of words and perverse disputings and all kinds of things that are destitute of the truth. Steer clear of that. But, verse 6, godliness with contentment, oh, that's great gain. But Paul loves his wordplay, right? He just said that gain is not godliness, but then flips it. Godliness is gain if you're content with what you have. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. 
And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. It's a great realization. It's like what Job said. Naked came I into the world. Naked will I go out of the world. The Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He trusted him. He was content. I once heard of a, a funeral of a very wealthy man. And somebody had asked, so how much did he leave? Kind of picturing the millions and billions, whatever it was. How much did he leave behind? And a very wise conversation partner said, oh, everything. Now, obviously, that's not what the man was asking. I wanted to know what his assets were. What was his net worth? But the other person, seeing things more clearly, realized right now none of it even, it even matters. You can't take it with you. So, naked in the world, you're not bringing anything out either. He says in verse 9, But they that will be rich, and that's the ultimate goal for some, they don't care how they get it or what they're going to use it for. Sadly, I've met some students like that over the years. You ask them what they want to be when they grow up and they just say, oh, rich. I'm like, oh, really? You don't, that's what you're majoring in? Money? Yeah, whatever I can do to get it. Well, careful. Because those that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And what an interesting verb there. We've seen swerving and, and shipwreck. And now we get drowning victims. And what are they drowning in? Their own greed. I pictured in my mind a quicksand made out of coins. And there they are swimming. In, I mean, this is like Scrooge McDuck, right? And he's swimming around in his wealth, but it's swallowing him up. They're drowning in it. And then one of the most famous verses in this book for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Oh, pierced themselves through? That was never their intention. Well, when you're aiming at the wrong target, you never know what, where that arrow might land. And sorrow? Oh no, I was trying to buy my way out of that. Oh, careful. Because when that was what you loved, you would do anything to acquire it. And that usually brings sorrow to others as well as back to self. Now, please be careful. Remember here, money is not the problem. It's the love of money that is. And that's a huge difference. I'm amazed at those who can be trusted with wealth because the Lord knows what they will, they will do with it. Remember that great verse in Jacob chapter 2 where he says, Before you seek for riches, seek for the kingdom of God. And after you have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches if you seek them, for ye will seek them with the intent to do good. I already know that. You've proven yourself. You can be trusted with the wealth. You have an unkinked hose. You better believe I'm going to send the water through it, because you'll make sure it gets to the end of everyone else's row. Bless you for that. It's those who kink the hose and who love the money for their, their own self's sake. They're the ones that that need to be careful because of the sorrow that eventually comes as a result. It's the root of all evil. It's scary to think how many bad things have happened to, human, to humanity throughout time because of the greed of people who lust after the things of this world. Can't be us. So Paul says in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Just flee. Get up and run. Okay, Picture all that money as Potiphar's wife and leave whatever it's holding on to in her hand and get thee out. Okay, Flee these things. Follow instead. You see, now you're no longer moving in the wrong direction. You can move in the right one. And this is what you can follow. You can follow after righteousness, godliness. There's our term of the day. Faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Oh, Timothy, what are you chasing? What are the members there in Ephesus chasing? Is it the wealth of the world or the gifts of the Spirit? Which, whichever one they're after, I, I have a feeling they'll obtain. But to follow after righteousness, oh, it's going to be a fight. <laughs> 
but it's the fight of faith. And fight as well as you can. There's that armor of God again. That's soldiering on, pressing toward the goal. In verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. This is the only time outside the gospel or the book of Acts that Pontius Pilate is mentioned. And here's Paul remembering that exchange between Jesus and Pilate. And Jesus' confession was a good one. He defended the truth even at the cost of his own life. He didn't care what happened. My kingdom is not of this world. What is truth? I'm truth. What Jesus said in the face of imminent martyrdom is incredible. And Paul is telling Timothy to hold on to that. Go and do thou likewise. He says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's second coming context for this one, like we saw last week in Thessalonians. Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Another beautiful breakout in song, this hymn of praise. It's tricky, though, when it says, no, nobody's ever seen him. But here's the tricky part. When it says, whom no man hath seen, the Greek word there, I mean, we're, we're pretty clear in English where it's whom versus what or which or that. But the Greek, it's the same word used here. And so what the King James translators translated as whom, as if all of this refers to Jesus, it could also be translated merely which. So if it's not him that we can see, what if it's the light that no one can see? When you put it in that term, or in those terms, there's Jesus dwelling in the light which no one can approach to, a light which no one hath seen or can see. That's the light that surrounds Jesus Christ. No wonder we have to be transfigured even to see through the glory. In this case, imagine coming into Christ. I mean, if you've, all that glitters is not gold, but glow, gold is pretty glittery. It's that shine and sparkle that seems to attract the gaze. And yet, what about this light? This is a light unlike anything you've ever imagined. A glory beyond explanation. And since light is what allows you to see, then unimaginable light, I would assume, leads to unimaginable sight. And to see things as they really are, to see yourself in that light, reflecting God's glory which he gives to us, Think about the great verse in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. When he shall appear, and we saw this in light of the second coming, the appearing of our Lord Jesus. So when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Can you picture that in, in, in light of what we just read? That there's some light like we've never imagined. And so to see ourselves, to see him, to be like him, we're infused with that same kind of light. It's what the Doctrine and Covenant section 88 says, that light cleaveth unto light, that we, we will be reflected in God's glory. Now, there is a JST of this that also helps clarify. When it talks of Christ as the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Joseph then, by inspiration, adds this phrase, to whom be honor and power everlasting, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, unto whom no man can approach, only he who hath the light and the hope of immortality dwelling in him. So this goes back from the which to the, to the whom. So, oh wait, so we can't see, can't see the Lord? Well, not unless you're like him. That's why I love that verse in 1 John. That's why I love the verse in section 88. To see him, we have to be like him. To see to, to enter into that light, we must be glowing brightly ourselves. And to me, there's something powerful about having the hope of immortality dwelling in us and that shining a light that casts out all darkness. It's those people 
and only those people who have eyes to see what lies within that unimaginable light. Paul then says in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Think about the parable of the rich fool and compare it to what Paul just said to Timothy. Remember the rich fool was, man, I'm, I'm living the American dream. I'm, I'm set for retirement and I'm, I need bigger barns to hold my accumulated riches. So tear down what I've got, let's build bigger. And he dies that night, not realizing, oh, and what did he leave? Oh, he left everything. I don't get to take it with me. Well, if that's the rich fool, Here's the rich wise, and it's someone who trusts in real riches, not the uncertain riches. That's such a great phrase. Compare rich in this world to rich in the next world. Compare high-minded to the lowly of heart. Compare uncertain riches to the real riches of God, and compare rich in good works to the people that are poverty-stricken when it comes to serving other people. Ready to distribute. Looking for those around me that I can bless because of the things with which God has blessed me. Where have you laid these things up in store? Oh, in heaven. And if so, God can trust you with something laid up in store on earth. He then says to finish this chapter and this book, O oh, Timothy, and can you hear the love in Paul's voice there? I love the O. It's like, Santo hijo de mi alma. It's like, dear, beloved son of my faith, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Just hold on to it. Other people will try to tear it out of your grip. Hold on to this. Avoid profane and vain babblings. We're back to those vain janglings we saw in chapter 1. It's this godless chatter. Just ignore it. Avoid it. And oppositions of science, falsely so-called, forget that too, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Well, grace be to thee. Amen. I mean, kind of a stark ending there. It's almost like, oh, sorry, got to go. And then click, hangs up. Or, well, I, I, I'm going to write a second letter anyway, so I, 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 can, <laughs> I can add more to an ending then. But for now, got to go. God's grace be with you. But what he said before that. He ends this chapter, or this letter, the same way he began it. He brings it full circle. And he brings it back to this idea of keeping doctrine pure and trusting in the simple truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forget the vain babblings. Forget the, oppositions of, the opposition of science falsely so-called. Now, this is tricky because in the 19th century, there was a book called The War Between Science and Religion. And post-Enlightenment period, there seemed to be a war going on. You think Galileo against the Pope, for example. And you see the reign of reason against the reign of revelation. People putting more and more eggs in reason's basket until people, even in the church, didn't feel like faith was something worth holding on to. It diminished them in the eyes of the worldly wise. Now, we have to be careful here because the King James translators chose that word science. And in some ways, it's unfortunate because it makes it pits science and religion as the enemy. And honestly, in 1611, when the King James Version was published, what did they mean by science in 1611 anyway, <laughs> right? Yeah, that would have been science, so-called, in most areas. Well, the actual word in Greek comes from that word gnosis, where we get the word knowledge. There's is G-N-O, and we use the K-N-O. There's a silent letter to start either way, but it's so-called knowledge that Paul is worried about. It's the so-called knowledge that he worried the Corinthians about. Words of men's wisdom and flowery language. Nope, I'm going to determine to know nothing compared to that. Trust in the power of God, the Spirit confirming truth. Timothy, you need to do the same. I mean, there's a lot of worldly wise in Ephesus, too. 
You've got one of the wonders of the ancient world. There's some amazing things going on there. So be careful about that, but avoid those so-called oppositions that only look like they're opposed to faith because it's so-called knowledge pushing against it. I mean, in some ways, anytime you do see conflict, I and mean, we, we can, we, fine, let's go with science, okay? Again, theirs was broader. It was just knowledge in general. And is this kind of the Gnostic knowledge of those that, oh, I know the endless genealogies. I, I know the vain babblings and janglings and, and they're not vain at all. Well, it's a little self-serving, fine. But come to me and I'll teach you the real stuff. Oh, beware of all of that. That's just knowledge, so-called. That's the philosophies of men, mingled or not so mingled with Scripture. And we need solid truth. We need pure doctrine. No sleight of hand, no cunning craftiness, no deception. Hold to what you know is true. And if you want to talk science and religion in a post-enlightenment modern world, fine. But realize whenever there is opposition between them. I mean, this is something that President Irene's dad would have loved. Because he was a believing scientist. A friend of Albert Einstein. And yet a friend of God as well. Who saw no conflict. Warfare between science and religion? What are you talking about? They're both authored by God. God the creator and God the revealer. And it's the same source either way. So if there ever seems to be conflict or opposition, then it's either religion or science or both that is merely so-called. So-called religion would have a problem with science. So-called science would have a problem with religion. And so-called religion and so-called science really have problems. <laughs> but if it's real religion and true science or true knowledge, then in either way it's inspired of God and meant, us, meant to help lead us to Him, to see His hand in the handiwork of creation as well as revelation. First Timothy is an amazing letter. I, it will take a lot less time to get through Second uh, Timothy. And then we'll fly into Titus and Philemon's super short, just a single chapter. So hopefully the second half of our lesson will not be quite so time consuming as the first. But to pause here, to review the incredible one-liners Paul has given Timothy in this first letter and through Timothy given to all of us, there is so much to hold on to. So hold on to these. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Given to hospitality, apt to teach. Have a good report of them which are without. Great is the mystery of godliness. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, godliness is profitable unto all things. Let no man despise thy youth. Be thou an example of the believers. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Marry, bear children, guide the house. Keep thyself pure. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The love of money is the root of all evil. Flee these things and follow after righteousness. Fight the good fight of faith. The blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Is that enough instruction for you yet, Timothy?
you probably feel the weight of the world weighing you down. And any good bishop out there? Anyone who's just received a calling that overwhelms them? Well, slow down. <laughs> Take it easy on yourself. And turn to books like this, where someone who has been there and done that is able to give you good counsel. I am thankful for the counsel of Timothy here. I'm not a bishop right now. I, I have plenty of other responsibilities that weigh me down heavily. But to feel Paul cheering me on, urging me to fight the good fight of faith, oh, it's a fight. But it's one that we've been assured victory. And it's worth it. I testify of that. I am grateful for the incredible example of Paul and of Timothy, who received these words and acted upon them. And we're only halfway done. Turn to 2 Timothy and you'll be amazed at the advice that continues to come from a senior companion that absolutely loves him.